Good morning, everyone, and can I welcome you to the 33rd meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2018. Can I remind everyone present to turn off their mobile phones? As meeting papers are provided in digit format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. This is the second day of Stage 1 evidence on the Fuel Poverty Bill, and we will hear from two panels at today's meeting. We will be taking evidence on this bill from now until the end of December before reporting to the Parliament on the bill early in the new year. For our first panel today, I welcome Patrick Flynn, Head of Housing and Regeneration, Glasgow City Council, Chris Bateman, Business Planning Manager, North Lanarkshire Council, Dave Stewart, David Stewart, Policy Leads, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations, and Alexander McLeod, Housing Manager, Strategy, Aberdeenshire Council. Welcome to you all. Thank you, too, for all your submissions. And we'll go straight to questions from myself before the other members come in. Can I ask your views on the main drivers of fuel poverty and the degree to which each driver contributes to overall fuel poverty rates and levels? Would anybody like to kick off? Mr Stewart. Hello. Yes, um, I, I think it's important to remember that there's more than one driver of fuel poverty. Obviously, in Scotland, we've tended to focus on energy efficiency because that's a, a devolved matter and something that, that can be addressed. But um, income levels, um, the cost of um, fuel, and also maybe not quite such a big factor, but behaviour and people understanding how to best use energy systems or, or how to get a better deal or the appropriate energy tariff are also important. So I think it's important, even though I would argue that we need to focus on and, and invest in improving energy efficiency standards, to remember that that's, that's not the only factor. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to comment? I think we welcome the recognition of the four drivers David's mentioned three of them. Um, I think uh, the two main ones that uh, on infl inflationary fuel prices and low household income have been the key to the fuel poverty indicators, perhaps not, not having been met in the future. Uh, we, I really represent practitioners who are working in the poor energy efficiency of property sector and external wall insulation and the rest, so our evidence will be heavily weighted towards that. But I think I think the Chair's question is a recognition that those first two factors that I mentioned are perhaps crucial to how the indicators indicators are delivered in the future. Mr <coughs> Bateman? Uh, we share those views on the drivers, but we view the household income as perhaps the primary driver of fuel poverty because uh, if your income is sufficient, then you can withstand rising fuel bills and you can live comfortably in a drafty old home. So I think our focus perhaps should be more on inclusive growth, creating jobs and reducing inequality more generally. Thank you. Mr McLeod, do you have any comment? Yep. Um, just to add, I think it's important to recognise that um, behaviour is, uh, is something that's emerged in recently and that is something which is reflected locally in Aberdeenshire. So. Um, it's important that the fuel poverty strategy itself that's proposed is, uh, re recognises the four different drivers and how they inter interlink. Um, one of the concerns, certainly for us in Aberdeenshire going forward, is, is where certain properties may not be feasible um, for those to meet the uh, energy efficiency standards. And then how, how do we get that household out of fuel poverty is the question. So that's where the other drivers come into play. Thank you very much for that. The, the, the Prices and income aspect of it, I suppose, takes me on to my next question, which is about, given the limited powers in the areas of fuel prices and household income, what do you think is the wisdom of the government setting a fuel poverty target when they have such limited powers? I, I accept uh, the point um, that um, it's a challenge um, when um, the Scottish Government or Scottish Parliament only have control over um, energy efficiency. But I think that said, um, it's still important to work to address fuel poverty. And I think um, while there'll be significant costs in increasing the energy efficiency of homes, it's important to remember the, the benefits that can accrue too. Um, there was a study for Citizens Advice Scotland in 2014 that found that um, investing in energy efficiency to address fuel poverty was um, the most effective way for a government to 
invest public funds because there was big benefits in terms of jobs created, there was economic benefits, but also importantly there was social benefits for the people. So I, I, I take your point, but um, I suppose I would argue that even though we're not in control of all the drivers, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and address field poverty. No, but the target must be more difficult to set, surely, if you don't have control of prices uh, and income. And would it not mean that in, in Scotland, for example, they would have to spend more to make sure that they had the same level playing field as if they had control over prices and income because they would have to go down the energy efficiency route uh, without being able to balance that with you know, methods of being able to improve the income or to have some control over the prices? I, I think that that's a fair point, but th then we said in our evidence that there are um, things that can be done. For example, um, a group of housing associations have set up their own energy supply company with the aim of um, providing more affordable tariffs to people on prepayment meters. And in the long term, they hope to actually not just be energy suppliers, but also to either generate energy or heat. So I accept your point, but there's there's still things uh, we can yeah, do. Well, yeah. Undoubtedly, thank you. Yeah. Does anybody else have any comment on that? We'd also accept the, the challenges, given that the Scottish Parliament doesn't have all the full range of powers that it might, or some of its members may want. Uh, but I think we would acknowledge that it's a legitimate aim of public policy to eradicate fuel poverty and that over the next generation, our Parliament should be able to stimulate the economy, improve household incomes, and that's also a key factor in driving uh, down rates of fuel poverty. Okay, just the last one, and then you can come in, and, and, and the others can come in at both points. Uh, the length of the target period and the government's reason for choosing this 2040 target period, what's your views on that? <laughs> Mr McLeod first. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I think it's 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 pragmatic to set it at 2040. Um, I know there has been um, a, a push to to bring it forward to 2032, um, but certainly that we have to recognise the the pace of technological uh, change and the pace of co the cost for that innovation, technological innovation coming down, um, which may make it impractical to deliver it sooner, um, as much as we'd like or like it to feel poverty to be eradicated at an earlier stage. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I echo the sentiments that it is a, a practical uh, timescale. There are a number of other timescales out there just now, each and the committee will be aware of them. And uh, our job is to operationalise Scottish Government policy and if those targets could be uh, aligned as much as possible, it would help when we are bidding for funds in particular. Um, I think that our council would like the government to consider statutory interim targets reported every three or four years on the way to the 2040 target um, to allow for any adjustable, adjusted shortfalls in, in the policy environment, the strategy environment that changes uh, things along the way. I think leaving it to 2040 is too long. Okay, thank you. <coughs> we share both of those views. Uh, <coughs> And I think uh, it makes a lot of sense to align the fuel poverty target with Energy Efficient Scotland and with Housing Beyond 2021. So we think there's a lot of value in integrating all the approaches in these related areas. Can, can I just clarify, uh, when you say you support both views, do you mean that you think the 2040 target's too long, or do you think that there should be interim targets in between? And I think both both my colleagues said that 2040 is probably the pragmatic timescale, okay. albeit okay. that the milestones should perhaps be set. Uh, there should be yeah. additional milestones mm -hmm. put in place, but right. 2040 would be a pragmatic time. Right, you thank think? you. Mr Stewart. Uh, I'm going to be the odd one out. Um, we'd like to see the target set for 2032. There's Part always one. Yes, <laughs> partly because we feel 2040 is a long time for people to be in field poverty, so we'd like the targets to be more ambitious. But also, um, other colleagues have mentioned the uh, energy efficiency standards for social housing and energy efficient Scotland, and we think tying in the target date with those would would make sense, e even if it was challenging. Okay, thank you very much, Alec. You Could I just to... maybe pick up a couple of points that, that you made there? One. One in terms of this, this idea of the energy supply companies, I know that 
North Ayrshire, for example, has been doing some work on that. Do you think that there's there's much further scope there for local authorities or housing associations to come together uh, and and look at that? And what do you think of the the situation just now, where where you know we keep telling people that if they shop around. I mean, it just seems that, particularly if you if, if, if you look at these drivers of people who are experiencing poverty, the idea that you're going to spend loads of time trying to shop around and buy an electricity deal, for example. But where's the scope there, do you think, for, for, for the public sector? Well, first of all, I think there is scope for the, the public sector to, to get involved and help... Um, I mentioned um, Our Power, the, the grouping of housing associations, but, but I know um, local authorities have also been looking to do this. And I think anything that provides variety or, or a different offer or maybe particularly focuses on providing the same energy costs to people on low income and on prepayment meters is a good thing. I think it's a very good point you make on if people are vulnerable and have got other challenges, they're going to struggle to shop around. Um, and I think there, there's an opportunity for the public sector or the third sector to help. Um, Citrus Energy, um, based in Ayrshire, that are part of Cunningham Housing Association, provide a energy advice and switching service. And so they can effectively take that difficulty or challenge away from vulnerable people by offering to do the switching and, and get the best deal for people themselves. And that, that can make a significant difference to, to someone that's on a low income. You don't all need to answer every question. Uh, sorry, just to clarify. Uh, but if anybody feels that they, they want to, then feel free. Yeah, no, that, that. Okay, I like could I, could I, another point then, in, in terms of the committee looking at this bill, if we're saying there are four drivers here and in Scotland we don't have the powers over, over some of these key drivers, uh, do you think it's right that this committee should be highlighting that to be the case and where, where, where further powers are required? Uh, given that if we're serious about tackling fuel poverty, we need to be transparent and, and what needs to happen. It's perhaps more of a political question for, for us than it is for you, but, yeah. but but you get my drift there that would you like to see that kind of the, the committee take that approach? It's perhaps more of a political question. Yeah. But I think it's certainly appropriate for you to recognise those challenges and delivering on the target. And you can do that and, and raise these issues and say that we may actually need to uh, find additional resources to deliver on the, the challenges given that you're constrained in the powers that you have. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, so obviously the two uh, council representatives, uh, you both said that you, you think 2040 is, is about right um, and not 2032. Uh, and I just wonder whether the reason for you saying that is that you'll be required to do a lot of the work here. Um, uh, and clearly you need investment. Um, so I wonder whether you feel that that, that is the issue, that there's actually no, there's, there's no money um, to, to help you out. Um, in fact, uh, I think that North Lanarkshire actually said in, in your submission, um, the Scottish Government's continued support will be required to ensure that local authorities and others can effectively eradicate fuel poverty. So I guess that sums it up. So is that is that the nub of the issue for the councils? Chair, the, that's quite a big question. Um, the two issues on inflationary fuel prices and low household income, in a sense, is a, are a political issue and will, will kind of always be with us. The other two, poor efficiency of property, and behavioural issues are issues that the council, as a sub-strategy to the government strategy, can actively uh, make change. So, in Glasgow, for instance, uh, since 2013-14, we have had 11, over 11,000 measures on external wall insulation and other things uh, that have saved 500,000 tonnes of carbon and something like £2 million per year for the 11,000 
households and uh, savings on their energy bills. What councils, I think my colleagues will agree, need is uh, certainty uh, on the funding arrangements. So Heap Sabs, for instance, has been successful just now in allowing us to do area-based schemes, which is important for our city and for the SIMD areas in our city in particular. But in the short time I've been involved in this uh, area of work, there's been UHIS, CERT, CESP, ECHO, Affordable Warmth. Uh, there's, there's a number of changes. So uh, as officers, uh, we would like to try and de-risk that as much as possible because the bureaucracy of applying for these grants and knitting together the various grants, and that will always be the case, it looks like, knitting together those various grants, different times that they come into play, different uh, conditions of grant, different criteria for getting the grant. Uh, we have a team who knit that together with and make it work with some of our own private sector housing grant. Uh, so the 2040 thing for us is a recognition that if we get interim milestones then, and certainty in uh, funding, then we can make our sub-strategy work as well as we possibly can to uh, contribute to the national strategy. Um, yeah, my reluctance to commit to an earlier target than 2040 is really to do with resource, the availability of resources. Um, I think to, to date we've been fairly silent on where the resources will come from in order to meet uh, the targets we're, we're hoping to achieve. Um, this, the fuel poverty strategy itself seems to be fairly silent on the on the issue and I think it would be helpful if we, if we can cost out the delivery of the target across the public and private sectors, um, both at a local government and national government level. Um, and then we can start to have that conversation about how it will be paid for and how it will be delivered at, at an earlier stage, if that is what is deemed appropriate. Okay, thank you. Annabelle? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, good morning, gentlemen. Um, on that, on that uh, very issue of the er potentially earlier um, uh, date of 2032, I mean, given that it is accepted that we here in this Parliament have limitations on certain of the key drivers uh, as regards fuel prices and household income. Um, I just wonder then, and it's a question really for Mr Stewart, what he sees as the pathways to get us to the earlier 2032 position. Um, I, I, know, I had noted in the policy, memorand, uh, the policy memorandum to the bill uh, that one of the issues concerns the uh, development of low carbon technologies, allowing time for that, allowing time for the price to become more competitive for low carbon technologies. And the point being made that for your average domestic household, um, the, the earlier uh, acceleration, if you like, of the, the target date um, would be likely to place quite considerable burdens on individual householders across Scotland. Uh, and so how do you see that, Mr Stewart? Do you see that as something that Householders across Scotland would be welcoming um, because it would be a burden placed to a considerable extent on them. So, because what other pathway w would you see? I, I think um, what we would see as the way to address fuel poverty within the remit of the Scottish Parliament is to set energy efficiency standards across 10 years. Um, I set out in our submission that. Um, at the moment, only social housing has to meet energy efficiency standards, and that's actually seen um, a considerable improvement in standards to the extent that housing associations now have clearly the most energy efficient homes by tenure. And that's really been done largely <laughs> through the investment of their own resources from tenants' rents. Um, I take the point that um, it could be a challenge um, for some homes, and we're not saying that every home would meet a certain minimum energy efficiency standard. But at the moment, um, I think in the owner-occupied and private rented sector, there is scope um, for homes to be improved. Um, and actually, on the one hand, it might cost householders to invest, but on the other hand, they'll make savings in terms of um, cheaper fuel bills. And given that um, energy bills are projected to rise above inflation, 
and they have been for them um, the past 10 years. Uh, it's something that um, I, I think needs to be addressed. So I'm not saying it's not a challenge. Um, I, I would really echo um, Alexander's comment that really there needs the bills, the bill and the strategy are silent on costs and where the funding would come from. And I think there will be costs and, and to address fuel poverty, there needs to be a mixture of grants, low interest loans, depending on people's ability to pay. But um, at the same time, fuel bills are expected to go up. The Scottish Parliament has set very challenging climate change targets, so we need to think about um, housing, housing's role in, and not just social housing, which is you know, only a part of the housing sector. On the, this particular issue, I think we've talked about um, the fact that the Scottish Parliament uh, does not have devolved powers over to allow it to control incomes um, and energy prices, obviously. So we put that in perspective. In the last 15 years, we've seen incomes go up by 38% uh, in Scotland and energy prices 155%. So quite clearly that's uh, derailed the, the, the original target set by the previous uh, uh, Scottish executive. But in, in terms of the, the, the question that um, Annabelle raised, I just wanted to ask a supplementary, but how do you actually deal with people, for example, living in uh, who are owner occupiers in tenement or blocks, etc., etc.? Um, these people living in poverty and, can, and, and may, some may be able to apply for grants, but some others in the same block may not be able to apply for grants. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they've got money sitting in the bank to pay significant sums of money towards uh, energy efficiency. And if they're if they're older, they might they might just not want to actually do that. You know, the, you know, people coming into their home, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, they often find it intrusive. So how do you, how do you kind of try and square that circle? I mean, we all want the same objective. I'm just looking to see if you've got any, and not just yourself, David, but if any others, uh, local authority representatives, have any um, solutions to this particular issue because it occupies the majority of people in Scotland. <coughs> we have uh, extensive experience of dealing with uh, mixed tenure. Mm. Schemes, uh, in particular, mixed tenure up a close or four in a block. And it's a very complex uh, thing to deal with. We, the area-based approach works for us. Uh, we have a team who go out and talk to the folk uh, about their individual needs. And we have specialists through our partnership with the WISE group uh, called GHEAT. And the face-to-face -face, uh, discussion with clients is extremely important. We are finding that the funding for essential repairs, essential fabric repairs, is a major issue in the city. And we'll be coming uh, to our committee in about a year's time to discuss uh, the pre-1919 stock in particular. That's important because that type of stock, large windows, solid wall, is uh, very difficult to put uh, measures in place that uh, can bring it up to the standards that we're looking for. We also have a, a significant proportion of non-traditional stock. And non-traditional stock uh, is a rule of thumb, and don't hold me to it, our usual heaps ab scheme, so those 11,000 interventions. We get something like £3,000 of an owner's contribution. Uh, we get £6,500 from the heaps abs. And we get money from various other bits and pieces to make up the difference. A non-traditional property, British Iron Steel Federation or whatever, would maybe be twenty to thirty thousand pounds to do to bring it up to a similar standard. Uh, the non-traditional stock, especially owner-occupiers in this city, in our city, is a is a concern, a specific concern. The low incomes for owners. Uh, uh, has been mentioned. It's not as much of a factor as the, the increase in fuel has been, the fuel prices, but the income of owners, especially in our Scottish Index of multiple, multiple Deprivation Areas, where Glasgow has unfortunately an over-provision over of the lowest 5 and 10 per cent areas, that gives us uh, a real concern. That's where we focus, as per Scottish Government guidance, our fabric work at present, our 11,000 external wall insulations, focused on SIMD areas. 
And age can be a proxy for, for vulnerability, but absolutely uh, index of multiple deprivation areas can also be a proxy for vulnerability. And for people in low incomes, uh, an area-based scheme works well. It works well because we have one-to-one -one contact with owners. We can explain the benefits. And most importantly, we find practically, as well as the, uh, the trade, the subcontractors dealing with them on an area basis, is that neighbours talk to each other. So we find very often that the public meetings, you get a, a proportion of people who will buy into a scheme, and then through the scheme, as people see what's actually happening, then other people come in and, and buy into it. Uh, that seems to be more important than you know common sense would probably suggest. Uh, so that the neighbourhood aspect, to, neighbourhood aspect to owners becoming involved in the scheme, the area-based aspect is important in our city anyway. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I'm going to move on just now. We'll no, come back. Yeah, come yeah, back sure, to Alexander. Uh, Alexander, you wanted to come in now. Thank you, thank you, Convener. Gentlemen, you've, you've talked about some of the successes that you've all experienced across the housing sector, whether it's Council or Housing Association, in the energy efficiency and how that's improved. And we have seen a good uh, way forward on that over recent times. But you've also identified that it's finance orientated, it's resource based. So if you don't have the, the finances and you've identified that councils may be now struggling to manage that process to ensure that they can implement some of that, because if there's not the, the resource behind it and there's not the grant that's there, uh, then how do uh, individuals tap into that and see that there's going to be a, an opportunity for them uh, to try and tackle that, that, that efficiency uh, within their own property that they have, depending on the age of that property and the type <coughs> of that property? Chair, uh, we... Uh we have the one-to-one -one, uh, consultation with owners. At present, I've mentioned the, the specific cost is 6,500. So we've, we've invested uh, 95 million pounds on those 11,000 odd interventions since 2013-14. And 35 million of that is from Heaps Abs. That's our Heaps Abs budget over that time. So we've, we've benefited from that and we've used it as seed corn in, in order to add uh, other measures and uh, to have, a, I think, a successful programme. We think we've got eight years' worth of programme left that we can identify, uh, but at the moment it's unclear how we would take that forward because the dispensation is going to change. So, as officers, we at the moment we're, we're, we're unclear, but we are discussing it with Scottish Government uh, officials. And, and the, the challenge, <coughs> the challenge of that, that you face in trying to square that circle and trying to manage that process for the future, because that gives you a, a short-term or a medium-term approach as to what you want to achieve. But if we want to achieve the full goal and we want to get to the target by we get to the time, time scale of, of, of 2040, then, then, then that may not be achievable across your own tenure and across your own area. <coughs> the programme will have to change, uh, given the indications that we're, we have at the moment. There will possibly be a reliance on equity loans. Mm. And at present, our experience of equity loans is not a good one. Uh, owners, and especially private landlords, uh, don't tend to get involved where equity loans are the vehicle for uh, getting the measures done. So uh, we are communicating with Scottish Government officials what our experience of that is in terms of the equity loan fund. They, they have their own experience just now. And uh, I would suggest that unless there's grant, our existing yeah. programme, our yeah, existing, right. just won't happen. Yeah. It, it, it won't, it won't materialise if, if there's not the funding and the resource behind it to make it actually progress. Don't think so, Chair, no. Kenny, you wanted to come in yeah, on this point very briefly. For, for letting me in again, uh, I do, I do uh, appreciate it. Um, notwithstanding the issues of income and energy price that we've talked about, the Scottish Government um, is planning to, through this bill, help reduce the number of households in fuel poverty by 20,000 households, 3,000 households a year. Um, David is looking to change that date to 2032, which means 38,000 a year. Now, we've talked a lot about resources, but I'm wondering, do we have the, the workforce with the skills 
to actually deliver that? Because it's not just about money. Do we have people available who could step up? We know, for example, that there's going to be uh, issues in terms of uh, EU workers who, who um, um, and so there may be people who currently uh, work uh, on these uh, programmes who might do jobs that, for example, others do at present. So I'm just wondering if uh, how you feel about those resources uh, and is there any are there any proposals to do a step change in terms of training more people to do this kind of work? Um, I, I, it's a really, really good point, actually. Um, we, we've probably discussed this uh, more generally on the issue of new build affordable housing and the ambitious 50,000 homes target. And um, there is an issue both that the construction workforce that's from Scotland or the UK is ageing, but also, as you point out, with Brexit, there, there's concerns. Um, I would just say it is, it is an issue. I don't know that there's enough plans in place to address it for, for new build. I know there's um, work to promote the idea of off-site construction to encourage more people or, or a different group into the workforce, but I, I think it is something that has to be borne in mind because energy efficiency retrofit is labour intensive and, and we need to know that we've got the, the workforce to actually carry out that work. Thanks. Right, thank you very much. Okay. Hey, Andy? Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, the uh, the new definition is is a, is a more complicated definition than the, than the old one. It's designed to provide a more accurate assessment of the numbers of people living in field poverty. Um, however, at the same time, the strategy outlines the draft strategy outlines the kind of measures that will be put in place to reduce these numbers. Now, I noticed in Lord Lanarkshire Council's uh, evidence, you you say that. Um, clear mechanisms will need to be developed to ensure we can effectively identify fuel poor households under the more complex new definition. And the draft um, fuel poverty strategy talks about developing a fuel poverty assessment tool that's designed to take account of the proposed definition um, and enable targeting of funding to be more accurate. How, how well aligned do you think this new definition which will be assessed on a national scale from aggregate statistics. How, how well aligned do you think it can possibly be with um, an assessment tool that identifies which households need assistance? Is that actually possible? Uh, perhaps not, but certainly I think we are clear that we need to better identify the households that we should be targeting for advice and assistance. And we need some way of doing that. Because just now, if we want to, or under the new definition, if we want to identify someone that's in fuel poverty, we need to know the energy performance of their home, the energy costs that they should be incurring uh, to maintain a satisfactory heating regime based on their current tariff, their household composition, including <coughs> demographics and their health or vulnerability status, their household income and their housing and childcare costs. Now, in most cases, we have access to EPC data, uh, but we don't have a baseline of energy costs that households should be incurring. We might have information on household composition, but that's collected by our council tax services, and for data protection reasons, they can't share it with us. We don't have any usable data on health or vulnerability. We don't have reliable income data at household level, and we don't know a household's housing or childcare costs. Now, we may obtain that if they're going to approach us directly for assistance, but if we're going to eradicate fuel poverty and lift thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out of fuel poverty by 2040, then we're not going to do it by taking a reactive approach and a piecemeal approach. So I appreciate that the measure is about aggregated data from you know the House Condition Survey, but on the ground we need some way of being able to target advice and assistance and uh, support and interventions at the households who need it. And without it, then we're not going to be able to do it. So how do you do that just now? Uh, well, we don't necessarily have uh, target advice and information services. I think that's across the board. We would say that in terms of household behaviour, it's insufficient. You know, we don't uh, we don't engage with households who are fuel poor as, as well as perhaps we could or should do to eradicate fuel poverty. In terms of heaps abs, it's the same as Glasgow, and we use the Scottish Government guidance to target at the summed areas. So that's how we do it. But it's a very blunt measure and tool. You know, within a, a sound area, there are plenty of households who have sufficient household income to be well out of household, well out of fuel poverty. Uh, so we think we would need uh, more 
in better quality information to take an incisive approach rather than the blunt one that we do just now and it seems that we'll continue to do in future. Yeah, um, just to add to Chris's point, um, I think at the moment we use proxies um, like income and, and whatnot, but um, I think that's shown to be quite weak in the evidence review that was published by the Scottish mm -hmm. Government, the correlation between income and fuel poor. Um, so we really need to get a hold of this data question uh, a lot uh, a lot better than we do at the moment. Um, certainly the, there are limitations with the household survey. Um, and I think there's an opportunity here um, to better integrate and better link the data sources that we hold, not just within local authorities, but right across the public sector, through the private sector, um, through national databases um, and through smart meters. And, and there, there's a lot of data out there that we're probably not tapping into at the moment. Where we maybe we're not in that position quite yet, but I think in time, and certainly well ahead of 2040, we'd hope to, we'd hope to be in that position where we should be able to better target the people that we need to um, to support with our investment because we're not really in that position at the moment. But do, do you think you're using proxies at the moment? Do you think the relationship between the current definition and those proxies is a closer definition, closer relationship than the relationship between the proposed definition and the likely proxies to deliver that? In other words, is it going to be more difficult to target support under the new definition than it is to target support in relationship to the current definition? I, I think it's I think it's a helpful step forward under the new definition, and it does allow us a bit closer targeting of, of, of where we need to invest. But, but in practical terms, you're saying it doesn't because you don't have the data to be able to... Well, it's still, still some distance away from where we need to be, okay. um, but it's a, it's a helpful step forward, albeit a small one. Okay. Is that yeah. you in? Right. Thanks very much. Great. Great. Oh, sorry again. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Convener. It's just a follow-up um, to uh, Chris Bateman. Um, I think I heard you right. North Lanarkshire doesn't have... Uh, an energy advice service, is that correct? We have services that support uh, people. Uh, it's probably not an area that I'm, I'm an expert in, but we certainly have an energy advice service of, of some description, uh, but it's not. we would argue that it's not sufficient, really. Uh, and we know, for example, we, we have an aspiration to do better than, than we're currently doing, uh, but we... I think that we, my colleagues would share this uh, view, is that to do it effectively, we probably need additional resources than, than we have just now. I mean, it is obviously a choice for the council. Yes. Um, uh, some of the committee visited Dundee, where they do have um, uh, quite yeah. an extensive service and uh, seems to operate very well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's the position in the other councils, I'll, Glasgow? Just, and if I could follow up on that, we do link yeah. them with Home Energy Scotland. So in, in some respects, we refer on to them when we have concerns and we have issues or we want to provide advice. Uh, but we don't take the Dundee-like approach and be more intensive in how we deliver our advice service. Uh, but I think uh, going forward, if we're serious about meeting the, the target, then we're going to need to consider how we better do that. Right, OK. I don't want to box you into a corner. You might get into trouble mm. off your council leader. But uh, uh, what, what's the position... Uh Within the other councils? Like other councils, we would use Home Energy Scotland, and I'm sure uh, that is used in, in the Lanarkshires. Uh, we have G Heat, which is a partnership with the WISE Group, which is reactive but does uh, have one to one energy advice for uh, folk, uh, <coughs> owner occupiers across, in particular across the council area. And the Wheatley Group have their own uh, energy advice team uh, for the 45,000 uh, Wheatley Group. Uh, residents in the in the city um, so we have a, a number of services that plug in we also have a partnership with the citrus group which was mentioned early earlier in terms of fuel switching which in the future will be for domestic for business at the moment but will grow into uh, switching advice for domestic customers mm -hmm. uh, yes we provide uh, funding to scarf to provide that service and, uh, and it works well and uh, it's something we measure on for our local uh, housing strategy in terms of fuel poverty outcomes so. Okay. Could, could, could I maybe come back to this question of, of being able to have the data to, to target better? Is it, is it that you're saying the technologies are not available just now, or is it that the, the data is available but there's, there's barriers there, and is that something that the Scottish Government should be 
looking at or is it something that local authorities should be looking at in terms of being able to target it's one thing to say that that you know the data will be available by 2040 but for those of us who believe that actually you need to bring that target forward to 2032 uh is, is, is that a major block and how do we how do we unblock that um yeah some of the data is is out there um but um, some of it won't be available, or it's, it's, it's a lot of it to do with the permissions around it, um, and and whether you've got information sharing uh, practices in place. Um, typically, some of those won't be in place at this this moment, or there may be um, perceptions around about data protection that we need to get around. Um, so some of it's in place, and we, we, it's really about starting that conversation with with the partners involved about how we do, how do we start to better share that. Um, um, so we can do the, mo the the best we can, and and sometimes there are gaps, particularly in rural areas, and we're not we won't be able to account for what is um, spent on fuel um, without that kind of one to one visit type approach. Um, so that's that's you know that's still something that we can work on. Can I just come in on that because uh, Chris Bateman talked earlier on about the problems with data sharing as well. If you if you could get those problems solved, would that save you a lot of the on the ground work? the door-to-door -door stuff? It would enable us to actually do that. You know, we don't want to go around 150,000 houses yeah. to, to yeah. identify who might be or might not be in fuel poverty. And I think there's a, a, some one of uh, the comments being David's submission was about how building trust was really key. Uh, so, you know, you're not going to build trust by having somebody with a clipboard at your door saying, how much do you earn? Uh, so I think it would be really important to get that data sharing uh, sorted out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kenny, you were wanting to talk about some rural stuff? Yes, I, I thanks very, uh, very much, Convener. I'm just wondering what, what the panel's uh, uh, view is on the decision not to include a minimum income standard uh, markup for remote rural and island households um, and also households where people have disabilities or long term illnesses. Okay. Uh, we felt, um, while we support the move to um, the new definition and as far as it takes account of um, people's incomes after housing costs, we feel that it's uh, a mistake not to take up uh, the rural minimum income standard. Um, when we run events on fuel poverty or speak to members, um, we're generally given the impression that fuel poverty is at its greatest extent and at its deepest level. and. Uh, rural off-gas areas because people have got higher living costs because fuel costs are higher and particularly in the highlands and islands where there's a effectively an additional transmission charge for electricity which is the main heating fuel so while we support the new definition we would want to see the the rural minimum income standard adopted now, I've got two islands in my own constituency, Cumbria and Ireland, with over 6,000 constituents. Uh, do, do you feel all islands should be included in that, or should there be caveats? And how would you define remote rural? Uh, because, you know, one person's remote rural might not be someone else's, and what we do, wouldn't want was an arbitrary definition. So I'm just wondering how you would um, address both these issues. I, I think um, there's probably an argument for including all, all islands because... I would imagine that living costs are higher. I suppose where there might be a difference is whether uh, inhabitants of islands have access to the gas grid or not, because that's a, a major difference in heating costs. Um, as far as uh, definitions of rural, I think there's a Scot the Scottish government uses a definition and there, there's various different gradations, so it, it might be maybe if, if we're looking to change and have um, a definition that looks at rural to look at the different um, definitions and then maybe for the parliament to s decide which ones should be included. I, I think there's about five or six different categories going up to remote and rural, which is the the most remote. Well, it's where you have the cut off. I mean, yeah. UK definition of rural, for example, is 10,000 households, which is yeah. a pretty big town in, yeah. in Scotland. Um, yeah. uh, Scot Scottish government's about 3,000, but, um, but it's where, where you make that cut off, you yeah. know, 100 houses, 200, 500, 1,000. Yeah. So it's just to see if, if, if there's anyone, any other views on that. Aberdeenshire, for example, is quite rural. Yeah, and we'd certainly support the rural minimum income standard um, and would echo what David was saying. Um, 
there's an opportunity here to define what rural is in a fuel poverty context because it may not align specifically with the remote rural six-fold uh, classification. So um, I'm sure, I mean, there's research being carried out and I know you had a, quite a wide ranging discussion on this last last week in this committee. So um, we certainly support the kind of the, 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 the research that has been carried out on that. I mean, one could argue that if you're off grid gas, you should perhaps be included uh, if you live in a rural area. But, you know, as we progress over the next two decades, the, the Scottish Government and indeed the UK Government are committed to moving to non fossil fuels, which may or may not be more expensive. But certainly at this stage, they are more expensive. So, how do you address that? Because at the same time, you're trying to get people to, for climate change reasons, to move off fossil fuels, but they're a much more expensive form of fuel. So, how do we, how do we um, deal with that conundrum? I think, first of all, I'd say that's that's a huge challenge. And actually, um, I referred to that in our submission. Um, housing associations and council landlords face a significant challenge with proposals for the energy efficiency standards for social housing that are proposed to follow the current ones and run from 2020 to 2032. Because to an extent, they're really looking at that move to low carbon heating and figures on the consultation document estimated that it would cost on average £6,000 per property, but the benefit to the bill pair would only be £160 per year. So that is a huge challenge. I mean, it could be that technologies such as smart meters and smart grids or possibly the introduction of a low carbon heat through district heating systems might bring those costs down, but um, I'm not giving a straightforward answer, but just to say it, it's a big challenge, and that's partly why we've called on our submission for housing associations to have equal access to the Scottish Government's um, area-based schemes, because otherwise, at the moment, um, there's a danger of uh, rents having to be used to invest significantly mm -hmm. to meet those standards, but actually the bill savings not not really been as reflective of, of the investment as they would have been previously. Mr Flynn, you, you want to come in as well? Chair, it was your initial question when you mentioned health as well as the, the rural aspect. And mm -hmm. Yes, council, disability and long-term illness, that's absolutely. right. The council, our council supports <coughs> broadening the enhanced heating regime to capture households where an occupant's health condition would benefit from a higher temperature regime, regime regardless of age. Uh, I think it might be useful in terms of vulnerable consumers uh, in the second uh, panel that uh, we are contributing to the UK energy consultation at the moment on vulnerable consumers. And I think the advice from that might be useful, uh, certainly for our city, in terms of how we get to the vulnerable consumers that were, were mentioned earlier. It's slightly different from the, the rural cost issue, but I think it's certainly as important for urban areas. Okay, thank you. Thanks, unless, unless Mr. Barnett Bateman wants to say something. No. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Want, you wanted to come in on this. Yeah, I think it, it leads on uh, to a line of questioning I was I was going to follow actually when we we're talking about vulnerable uh, now, get consumers. Thanks, convener. Um, and uh, I, w I was struck by the uh, submission from Glasgow, but it applies to everyone uh, on the panel. Uh, where you, uh, you, you talk about uh, the change in the vulnerability age threshold um, uh, moving from 60 to 75 um, and you say that in Glasgow that, that don't, wouldn't really work because the life expectancy for Glasgow residents is much lower um, so clearly you know a lot of people could 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 lose out is that something that, that you think this committee should be looking at across the piece, not just Glasgow. We can start with Glasgow, but I'm interested to hear all your views. Chair, yes, I think we uh, were quite uh, open in our response that we are concerned. There's an estimated 39% of older households in Glasgow are in fuel poverty, according to the Scottish House Condition Survey 2015. Uh, the change from 60 to 75 uh, is an issue for Glasgow because uh, the council has uh, split Glasgow into 56 neighbourhoods for various operational reasons, and 15 of those neighbourhoods 
the men in the, the areas have a, a, a age of uh, under uh, 70. Uh, so um, that's a specific issue. And I think it comes back to some areas again, because when you look at concentrations of deprivation, the age issue absolutely comes out in that as well. So the current dispensation where heaps abs and other grants are related to index of multiple deprivation areas, we think is a very useful proxy in Glasgow to get to uh, vulnerable people and to get concentrations of building work that allows us to do the energy efficiency work efficiently uh, rather than having them dispersed and having the danger of perhaps cold calling for individuals. Uh, we have area-based schemes and we're capturing older people, in particular older people, vulnerable older people who are owner-occupiers in the city in index of multiple deprivation areas. Does anybody else want to comment? Yeah, um, I suppose I would just say um, on the one hand, I can see the logic of moving the age for Scotland as a whole, given that people are, are living longer. But um, I think Patrick makes some very important points that you can't really apply that across Scotland or even a, across 10 years of, of housing. Um, mm. And so I, I suppose it maybe goes back to the conversation earlier about with the new definition, does it make it more difficult to identify who should be targeted and, and do we need to look at data sharing protocols because certainly um, I think if there is a move to um, only being people over 75 then we really need to find um, other ways of identifying people who you know for reasons of health inequalities um, aren't enjoying good health or, or um, have much lower life expectancies. Yeah. No, nobody else wants in on that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, some parts of Glasgow life expectancy is an average of 66 years for men. It, it's, it's quite staggering. Um, so, I, get, I guess what you're saying is we need a bit, a bit of flexibility here. Um, I can't stress it enough. Convener, that's exactly what the city needs. Um, if, if older people over 60 uh, don't qualify for the enhanced heating regime, then it will have a detrimental effect on older households in the city and their health. I think that's the council feels that very strongly. Yeah. Sorry, Graham. Okay. No, Can fine. I ask you, Mr Flynn, if uh, you've been making this case to the government for special dispensation for Glasgow or for certain households or, or what? Chair, it's part of the consultation. We talk to officials of government regularly, and uh, what we're asking for is a retention of the current uh, conditions, the current 60, especially in some areas. Right, okay, which leaves us with the fact that people live longer in other parts of Scotland, so really it would have to be, I suppose, localised to some extent through some areas. Well, localised, and as uh, David said, uh, a further look at vulnerability and how that impacts. Um, age is one of the proxies, but uh, health conditions yeah. a number of others. It's how we capture that. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Anna, but, oh, just, just very briefly. You know, my granny lived to 92, but my grandfather lived to 41. Aye. You know, exactly. this is the issue about expectancies that can be, even in a sim, you know, they live in the same house, even in this, an SIMD area, you know, there are va huge variations. So, so I think the difficulty is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not convinced by the age of the 75 limit. It seems to me quite a huge jump from 60, but, you know, you, you let, you'll end up with some households will benefit regardless. However, however you set it much longer than others, it's a very kind of, it's almost it's an arbitrary. Issue, it? Yeah, it's how you can capture, I suppose, the most number of people, um, um, I think, in terms of doing this, you know. What, what the committee will be doing, Kenny? Yeah, I suppose yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Annabelle? On, uh, Whatever you want. New topic, okay. Um, yes, uh, looking at a, a slightly different issue in terms of the uh, proposed reporting 
uh, requirements set forth in the, the bill. Um, firstly, as regards to the, uh, the timing, the frequency of such reports, I think the current proposal is for a five-year approach. What, what would your collective or respective views be, uh, Alexander? Um, yeah, um, I think we'd welcome a more frequent uh, reporting periods um, and certainly to tie those into where we have milestones in terms of, for example, the, the social housing sector meeting energy efficiency, uh, social housing standard by 2020. We may want to take a, a look across Scotland as to the extent to which that's been met and then reviewing what that potential action we may need to take. So I think, I think every five years and, and beyond is, is a wee bit uh, on that high side and probably prefer something a bit more frequent in order to keep, also to keep abreast of technological change as well. What, what period would you then suggest? I think it's in a two to three year two to three. kind of range might be more um, appropriate. Um, we actually suggested um, annual in our um, response, but I think certainly um, we would want it to be more frequent. Um, Social landlords report on progress to each um, annually to the Scottish Housing Regulator, and I suppose that allows um, consideration of um, how much the, the cost has been, um, what funding's available, and also is the target going to be met? And if not, does there need to be changes in policy or funding? So if not annual, I, I think five years um, is too long in my view. So if not annual, would you su support the suggestion from Alexander of two to three? Yes. Yeah. We would share that with twice a parliamentary term would probably be sufficient. Twice a parliamentary term, yeah. okay. We would think three years, and especially if married to uh, at the ending of annuality for grants and loan schemes, mm -hmm. so that we can marry the, the grant funding mm -hmm. to the reporting period. Yeah, I mean, presumably an annual requirement might just prove a wee bit counterproductive because you have to allow sufficient time to pass in order to report on what's happening and yeah. a lot a lot of things would be happening so maybe it would be a wee bit unrealistic to, to expect an annual report possibly Logis logistically possibly also as i say social landlords do yeah, do but, that on each but yeah, um, but this is a yes. kind of global scotland-wide mm -hmm. report on a number of issues in terms of the substance of the report um the I think it was uh, Kaz who suggested that the report should be looking at the progress on each of the four drivers uh, that we talked about, fuel poverty we talked about at the outset of this evidence session. Um, what would your views be on that? I mean, taking into account, as has been said, uh, that there are very significant limitations on uh, the power of this parliament with regard to at least two of those uh, drivers being energy cost and household income. Um, and therefore, any substantive report focusing on those two issues would be uh, presumably in recognition of the fact that actually the power doesn't really lie here, uh, and but perhaps usefully therefore assessing what the impact of not having that power is. What would your thoughts be on taking that approach, you know, to the substantive nature of the actual reports being report being prepared? Um, I, I think it would make sense to report on all four drivers even allowing for the fact that um, they aren't all within um, the parliament's control. Um, it seems sensible to to measure all, all four really um, rather than otherwise I think there's a danger of um, focusing on one or two and, and not not getting the wider picture. What would you be? Yeah it would make sense to do that given there's an interrelationship between each of the factors. Okay. Yes, absolutely. The four drivers are the four drivers, and each should be measured. There are difficulties, behaviour, for instance, a cultural thing, but uh, given the work that a number of councils and others are doing in terms of trying to change that behaviour, I think we would welcome uh, an input to show how, how the work that we're doing. Alexander? Yeah, we need to look at the round. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, right, thank you very much. Uh, Andy? Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Um, just an observation first on the driver of household income. Of course, we're talking about net household income for purposes of fuel poverty. So the things that drive net household income, housing costs, childcare, council tax, those are all within our control. So in a sense, we have some control over what people's net incomes are. Um, on the, just following up from Annabelle Ewing's uh, line of questioning, on the uh, targets, um, 
what's the view of the panel at the moment? The bill just makes provision for that the minister shall lay a report, a review, uh, every five years. There's no proposals for any kind of scrutiny. We have, for example, in the Child Poverty Act, we have an, a Poverty and Inequality Commission and climate change legislation. We have the Committee on Climate Change. We have some kind of uh, independent uh, scrutiny. Do you think we need to have some kind of an scrutiny mechanisms or independent reporting mechanisms that, 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 um, that build on the duty on ministers to report? Um, I, I would support the idea of uh, scrutiny maybe being in line with what happens for the child poverty bill. I, I think fuel poverty is a, a big issue and, and so it makes sense to, to give it that, that level of scrutiny. How, how would that, do you have any ideas of how that might work? I, if, if you have any mm, further ideas, you can write. Okay, you can write yes. Yes. okay. <laughs> but when you say scrutiny, I mean, this parliament will obviously scrutinise mm this report every five years, there'll probably be a debate, there'll maybe a statement, etc., and a committee may well choose to mm -hmm. um, have a look at why or it's meeting targets or why, why it's mm -hmm. not. What I'm really asking is that should the bill be st strengthened in that regard to make some of that scrutiny uh, or independent monitoring uh, statutory or not? That's the key question. I, I think so. I mean, certainly on the, the climate change Bill, it's been. I think it's quite useful that there, there's periods of, of uh, review where where targets are set, and um, it's allowed, for example, consideration of what's a re reasonable um, target for decarbonising yeah. heating and housing. Um, so, I, I would support that a similar level of scrutiny. No further comments on that. Okay, there, we also have been, um, it's been suggested that an independent oversight body be appointed. Do you think that's got some merit or is that going too far? Again, like the Committee on Climate Change or the Poverty and Inequality Commission. It's not something we've considered to come to an informed view on. Okay, that's fine. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you, Andy. Uh, Kenny, did you say you wanted to come well, in? Well, one of the four parameters, obviously, behavioural change, and obviously there has to be significant change over the next two decades. I'm just wondering if the panel has got any idea of what the, what change we've seen over the last two decades and how much it needs to change over the next two. I, I would say I think there's a couple of things on that. There, I think there's something that we all need to do, whether it's um, the Scottish Parliament or local authorities or housing associations and others just to get across the importance of energy efficiency. I mean, it's quite um, energy efficiency in fuel prices and behaviour. Um, it's really quite surprising how few people actually switch energy suppliers given the savings that are possible. So I think something needs to be done, whether it's a, a big public information campaign just to I suppose emphasise the importance of um, behaviour and um, where possible in investing in energy efficiency, both to make savings but also to address climate change. But I would also say, reflecting on what some of the others have said, um, where people are vulnerable, um, I can't overemphasise um, the need for quality face-to-face -face energy advice. Um, I know there's good services provided uh, nationally um, by internet or by phone, but I think when you come to people that are vulnerable or have other issues going on in their, their lives, um, there can be a real benefit in having face-to-face -face advice, but then there's a question of how you ensure that there's equal access to that across Scotland and how you fund it. I think at the moment exists in, in pockets and in some places it, it works very well and, and some of these these initiatives have been mentioned already. But, but, but really the, the, what I'm trying to find out is how much we need, if this is one of the four key drivers, how much does it need to impact to, re, to reduce uh, poverty? So say for example there were no changes at all other than behaviour, would, we, would that would behavioural change alone re reduce fuel poverty by 5, 10, 20 per cent? How much of a, a component is that? How much are we relying on individuals um, to change their own behaviour, to take themselves to an extent out of fuel poverty? I mean, obviously we'll have other, me there are, will be other measures, but um, 
How much are we relying on people for that? That's what I'm trying to assess. Possible. I shouldn't particularly take account of household behaviour. Yeah. It doesn't mm. matter what, you know, it's a blunt measure of a satisfactory housing regime. Whether you're actually using your energy or not is a different matter. And how mm. you're using your heating controls is a completely separate matter. So, albeit it's a driver of fuel poverty it's in the real world, it's mm. not recognised perhaps in the definition that we have. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, right, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Graham, you wanted to come in on. Yeah, um, I just want to, we've got a draft um, strategy uh, which hopefully you've all. Had, had a look at. Um, there's been some criticism that that lacks detail um, on policies and programmes and it focuses too much on just energy efficiency. Um, I, I wonder what your views are on that. Um, yeah, I think there maybe has been a tendency both before the current strategy and Bill and there's a danger of that continuing where probably because um, energy efficiency as um, something that's a devolved power in Scotland and also because it's more tangible to actually see how many measures and how many homes have been improved. Um, I think there can be a, a danger of focusing too much on that and maybe linking that to the question about behaviour. Um, what you don't want to happen is have a situation where Homes have uh, technology retrofitted and, and there's a change in heating system and actually the householder loses the benefit of that investment because there's not sufficient advice given to them. So I, I, I think, um, you know, en energy advice and helping people with behaviour change or switching has to be a, a part of the strategy and, and it can't just focus on energy efficiency, although energy efficiency is important. Yeah, I mean, I think we welcome the, the vision direction set out in the strategy. And it's and one thing I'd say is it's fairly accessible and easy to read. Um, so it should have a, an appeal to kind of wider audiences. Um, and I've touched on it being fairly silent on resources. And, and I think there's more we can do in terms of data. Um, one thing I'd, I'd say, I think it's a bit light on how it links into local authority activity. Um, there's no reference really to local local housing strategies um, and all 32 local authorities have strategies and they all have strategic approaches in place to tackle fuel poverty. Um, so there is a, a tie in there, I think, that we're, we need to build on and include and so that we see um, fuel poverty as both a local and a national priority. Um, yeah, and that's my main comment on it. Mr Flynn. Into understand the delivery plan for the strategy, cost profile and funding sources. And as, as my colleague explained, uh, our strategy under that and how it can contribute to the national strategy, we would, we would want to put, be able to put our own strategy in place either through the housing strategy and in the future through El Heath. I would share the views of my colleagues. Our view was really that it was probably an interim <coughs> strategy until the, the bill was potentially enacted. So it was a wee bit light in detail for, for potentially for that reason. Uh, but we would share, share the views that we will be responding to whatever's in the, the national strategy and perhaps just now it's a little bit light in detail and light on the linkages with local authority actions. Thank you. Uh, Alec. Can I just move on to the, the financial memorandum and the fact that, that, I mean, I think it was Chris that said earlier that it supported the 2040 target on the basis of the, the lack of resources uh, in terms of even for a 2032 and you know organisations such as Energy Scotland have argued that you would have to double the current the existing budget yet the financial memorandum uh, is fairly light on that what's your view on that? Um, in our view, um, we thought um, it'd be more helpful for the bill not only to set fuel poverty targets, but also to set minimum energy efficiency standards. And ideally for um, either in the bill or, or in subsequent documents for there actually to be costings and then estimates of how that was going to be paid for, I, I think the bill is. is light on that. Okay, uh, Mr. Bateman. I think the, the memorandum states that an indicative overall cost for meeting the targets would be similar to the cost of delivering current programmes 
And it's difficult really to get informed view in that when uh, I think the strategy and the energy strategy says that we're going to be relying on as yet undeveloped technologies to do that. Uh, so it's, it's difficult to give an informed view in that. I would probably say that uh, eradicating fuel poverty has been a target for the, the Parliament throughout its existence, more or less. Uh, but we're still at a situation where a quarter of our population is fuel poor. So it's fairly clear that existing resources and doing more of the same is probably not going to be sufficient. And our concern would be to reiterate uh, what was said before, but also it's a real challenge in private housing in particular in terms of the essential repairs, non-traditional stock, uh, low incomes of owners and the complexity of mixed tenure projects. Uh, the challenges of them together, uh, coupled with the, the need for a bit more detail on cost, is, is it's a challenge. Yeah, yeah and, and just to add, the, the social housing sector is investing significantly in meeting each by 2020. Um, and, and I think those those costs um, need to be considered in the longer term as we look towards 2032 for each two um, and the potential impact that will have on tenants' rents. Uh, the, the investment is having an impact on tenants' rents, so it's just that kind of unintended consequence of, of rents going up in order to pay for the, the works. and and fuel poverty not actually been addressed. I mean, how, how difficult is that? I, I know that, for, for personal experience, I have uh, highlighted a case in Parliament a number of times where I visited a house when I was out campaigning in Paisley, and the the lady told me that the difference in her heating bills was something like for 25% of her income to, to under 5% under of her income. And in terms of child's health, the child had been who they lived in the damp house had been regularly having chest problems and in the hospital. So so we know the absolute benefits, but how difficult is it to assess the the costs and the benefits, both in terms of the benefits to the individuals, but also the economic benefits that could come to the the country in terms of in terms of the jobs, the skills, the training. How difficult is it to to estimate all that? Um, I, I think it may be as a complex task, but I, I referred earlier to a report, Citizens Advice Scotland, published in 2014, and it, it was uh, written by Cambridge, Cambridge Econometrics, and it, you know, and I suppose in broad terms, but it said actually, if you were looking at ways of investing uh, government spending, then energy efficiency targeted at fuel poverty was one of the most effective ways for the reasons you you've set out there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, no, sorry, there's others. Uh, Annabelle. Thank you, computer. Yes. Um, just a, a reference would be to um, energy efficiency measures in this bill. Uh, in fact, I, I note that the um, Minister for Energy, Paul Wheelhouse, made a statement to Parliament last week where he advised Parliament that he and the Housing Minister would begin work next year on a suite of of uh, legislative provisions. Uh, with regard to the delivery of energy efficient Scotland, and that seems to be to be a mix of primary and, and potentially secondary legislation, just as a technical clarification. Uh, with regard to the, the issue raised about the financial memorandum and, and the, the figures you would include in that, uh, as I had mentioned in an earlier question, uh, picking up on a point in the policy memorandum, um, you know, much activity will include the, the future development of low carbon technologies, but we, we don't yet have them and we don't know what the price will be. And over time, as with any technology, of course, price tends to come down. So given that that is the reality of the situation, what is it then that you know could be in the financial memorandum about such you know non-existent technologies? What, 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 how would you cost that? So I'm just not really following how... Uh, the financial memorandum could include items such as that, which will play an important role when we don't know what they are and what they'll cost. And it's just, it's a bit, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an unknown. So how can the financial memorandum take, into, take that into account with the best will in the world? I, I accept that it's a, a challenge to do that and new technologies will develop. Um, I suppose what I would say to that is I'm, I'm not sure that's a reason not to try and estimate at all the impact of energy efficiency or what the the cost might be. And, and I suppose going back to the question on 
how other bills are monitored. Um, the climate change bill through the independent scrutiny process does look at potential forthcoming technologies and, and costs. So what I would say is I don't think you would be able to arrive at an exact figure and, and figures would change over time as technology emerged. But I, I, I don't really accept that that's a reason just not to try and cost what the, the overall cost will be and to start thinking about what different funding sources might be, whether it's grant, low interest loans, equity release, or, or other forms of, of finance. Any other views? Mr. Point. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an opportunity to cost out what, in terms of the information we know now and what it would cost to do now, but um, with the kind of caveat that hopefully costs would come down in time. And at least then we can start to have identify the, the different tools and mechanisms that David identified that we would need to, to deliver it. Right. Andy? Uh, just coming back to uh, Mr Flynn, I think Glasgow City Council published a report to committee recently last week looking at uh, the indicative costs of bringing a lot of pre-1919 tenement property up to scratch. You were talking about figures up to £3 billion. No, you're shaking your head. You can, you can clarify exactly what that report uh, yeah. did or did not, did, did not, not say. So maybe you could clarify that first and then I'll ask my question. Sure. Chair, we sent a report to one of our policy committees and it was to inform them of a year's work from now uh, to look at a strategy for a pre-1919 tenements. Uh, there was no costing around it. Uh, we hope to uh, deal with that uh, in a year's time. As the committee will know, these are 140-odd-year-old properties and uh, we have 70,000 tenemental flats in the city. Some of the tenements were built at a very high quality at the time, others weren't, you know, rubble walls and whatever. So it would be uh, really unusual if it, we didn't have to look at the fabric of the, that particular build type uh, in itself. And we will do that over the next year. We've got drones flying about the city at the moment, looking at roofs and for 500 of the properties, for instance, and we hope to come back in a year's time with some more exact information and uh, allow our policy to, committee to take a decision on how we go forward. So, so just whilst I've got you on the record then, where did the numbers come from? Were they... Um, not from the council, Chair. Not from the council. So they came from the media, from politicians? Possibly. It's, it was 2.9... I saw the figure of £2.9 billion. Pounds. I have no idea where that figure came from. Chief. OK, it's useful to get that on the record. So my fundamental question is, it's going to cost a, a lot of money, obviously, to bring yes. um, old, particularly tenement stock, in Scotland's cities, mainly in Glasgow, to a lesser extent perhaps in Edinburgh, um, up to modern standards. Some of these buildings are, are, are dangerous, uninhabitable. Um, so how, what is, this, what is the scale of the challenge in relationship to fuel poverty and energy efficiency in these buildings compared to the wider challenge of making sure that they're structurally sound and wind and water tight? I think there's three aspects. One is those buildings can be very fuel inefficient because of the nature of the construction and very large windows in particular. So there is a specific issue. There are very often vulnerable uh, folk up in those closets and those tenements, so we have to deal with that. Uh, if you're doing energy efficiency works to that type of building, you also have to look at the general fabric of the building. And even in specific terms, you, if you're doing external wall insulation, you very often have to change the eaves and so that they marry up. And what we do is we try to have a holistic approach. So we have a private sector housing grant, one of the few councils that still have such a thing. So we often have to add to the heaps abs money, for instance, to allow an overall uh, improvement to a building. There's no point in putting an external wall insulation on a building that it's, that's got structural issues. So we deal with the whole building. And that will be an issue going forward for that type of building and also for non-traditional stock in the city, which has the same kind of issues in terms of dealing with the fabric, often at a higher cost than traditional stock. So in about a year's time, we hope to come to a, a, a report that will allow our policy committee to look at that in a bit more detail. Okay, thank you.
Okay, thank you very much. Graham, very briefly, please. Yeah, th th thanks very much, Convener. Just on the back of that, um, I, I, I read the report um, and it certainly didn't uh, contain that figure, um, 2.9 billion, uh, which I suspect was uh, an over-enthusiastic journalist uh, add adding things up. Um, but it did contain some figures, um, some alarming figures. Uh, so some of the, some of the blocks uh, could cost up to half a million pounds to, to repair. Um, that, that was certainly a figure that was in, in your report. You also helpfully mentioned the fact that we have here uh, a tenement maintenance working group um, which uh, consists of people uh, uh, across parties and outside stakeholders. Mr Stewart sits on it. Um, uh, and It's just really a plug for the group, to be frank, uh, Mr Dornan. Um, we'll be <laughs> publishing a, a, a draft report uh, in January, um, certainly keen to hear from any council who wants to feed in into that if you've not been involved already. Yes, free Apologies advertising for that. At the Scottish Parliament there. Eh? Okay, I've got <coughs> one last question then. What's your views on the Scottish Government's rationale for a 5% target rather than a 0% target? Does anybody have any? Um, I, I can see that ideally you would want to say it would be fuel poverty would be eradicated, but I think given that people's circumstances change and, and they move homes, etc., I, I don't know if 5% is the right target. I, I think the previous proposal of 10% was too high, but I think zero is maybe unrealistic in practical terms. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any comments on it? Mr McLeod. Um, yeah, I think it's a sensible measure. Um, one thing I would add is that we should still retain some focus on the extreme fuel poor um, within all this because, again, that's the, the uh, part of the population who we should be targeting our resources to. And there's, I suppose, there's again a danger of an un unintended consequence of focusing on people around about the margins of fuel poverty as getting the majority of the investment in order to meet figures as opposed to some people who may be a greater need. So I think that should still be a target that we should look to set through the bill. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, well, we would agree with uh, not zero percent to yeah. give us a bit more flexibility. Although we're a bit unclear as to where the five percent comes from, other than being a nice round number. Uh, so perhaps we, we could be consigning maybe too many people to fuel poverty because five percent sounds better than two or three. As an officer, we need targets. We just exactly. need to work to. And five percent does seem as practical. Is there anything? Our key consideration is the vulnerable consumer, and uh, I must echo the colleague from Aberdeenshire that uh, we have to make sure that we're addressing that issue. Okay, and I'm not sure, Mr. Bateman, that five percent was a limit that they would decide not to do any more work if they'd got to five percent and just leave the other five. Yeah, as, as my colleague says, we do need targets, though. So yeah. sometimes it's going to be target driven. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to finish. That. Okay. Uh, okay. In that case, can I thank you all for you coming here today uh, and to contributing towards our scrutiny of the bill. I'm now going to suspend briefly to allow a witness changeover. Thank you very much.
Okay. For our second panel today, I'd like to welcome Paul Blacklock, Head of Strategy and Corporate Affairs at Coloured Glass, Ross Armstrong, Managing Director, Warm Works Scotland, Simon Markle, Head of Public Affairs and Engagement, and Sarah Chisnell, Public Affairs Advisor, Scotland Energy UK. I can thank you all for your submissions, and I'll kick off with the, the first questions. Uh, Witnesses' views <clears throat> on the main drivers of fuel poverty and the degree to which each driver contributes to overall fuel poverty rates and levels would be very helpful. So do any of you have any comment on that? Um, thank you, I've got no view in terms of accurate percentages between which of the drivers and what, what they yeah, actually contribute. Yeah, yeah. But what we are c um, concerned about is that within the f all the fuel poverty strategies we've seen in Scotland, but also down in, in, in Westminster, there's been a lot of, of focus on the fuel bit, on the energy efficiency bit, and arguably not enough focus on the poverty side of things. There's only so far you can actually deal with fuel poverty by dealing with energy efficiency. Thanks very much. That's, that's interesting for us, yeah. Uh, Mr. Michael. Um, I, I would echo some of that, but I would say that energy efficiency is a key part in helping to bring down fuel poverty. It's one aspect of it. There are many different aspects. Um, if, if I could be cheesy, you know, the cheapest energy is the energy you don't use, and fuel and energy efficiency can help make sure you don't use as much. Okay. Yeah. I would echo that. I'd also point out that energy efficiency is the longer term of all the kind of policy solutions and instruments that are available to tackle fuel poverty. Policy instruments around income and around fuel prices can sometimes be short term in nature and they can be quite effective as a short term measure, whereas treating a home and making it as energy efficient as possible is a longer term measure that will make that house effectively fuel poverty proofed um, can make that house fuel poverty proofed over the longer term, which I think is why it's a these, are, these things are never an either or. All three drivers are important and they all have to be addressed. But I think it's important to kind of emphasise that energy efficiency is always the more sustainable and long term um, element of the policy strategy to, to tackle. Yeah, but given, given that the, the Scottish Government has limited powers in the areas of, of fuel prices and, and household incomes, why do you think? Do you think it was wise for them to set a fuel poverty target, given that they've got sort of one arm tied behind their back? Yeah, I mean, from my point of view, I definitely think having a target is an important element of the strategy, and having a statutory target is important because it binds um, a longer-term commitment to the policy area. Um, politics is, is often a transient business, and you, you'll find that administrations' um, policy priorities can change as things like the macroeconomic climate will change. But if there's a statutory target in place that binds the government's commitment to fuel poverty over the longer term, for, for us, that has to be a welcome um, and a central part of, of the strategy. Yeah, I'd say echo that. I, 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 you know, NGK supports the broad goals of the bill. I think it would help focus minds and momentum to make sure we do meet the 5% and make sure the Scottish government does meet the 5% target as set out in the bill. But there's so many aspects to it the, the bill and actually the strategy and the plan that comes as part of the bill will need to focus on um, as part of that, including where does the money come from? How are we going to finance this um, to meet that 5% target? Um, and so I think the 5% target is good. I think we broadly support it. Um, but to meet that, there needs to be a clear plan. There needs to be a clear strategy on how, on how the government deliver it. Okay, can I ask you, Mr Blackwell, before you, you, you respond, given that you said that... Uh, Income, I think it was income you said was the biggest driver. Uh, I didn't say it was the biggest driver. I was saying that I think that in the past, with the work that's been done, there has been insufficient attention paid to that element. Okay. You can improve somebody's house in terms of that it becomes energy efficient, but they still can't afford to heat it. Yeah. So yeah. It's, 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 it's achieving that balance. I think there is things that the Scottish Government can do in the benefits area. Certainly there was some discussion two, three years ago about simple things like moving the winter fuel payment for people living off grid through to, at the moment the winter fuel payments paid in December because the assumption is that's when people get their first gas bill that's not when people in the countryside get their first energy bill they fill up their oil tank their LPG tank the coal bunker back in the summer and certainly there were some discussions and I think there were some um, commitments made around looking to bring the winter fuel payment forward for people living off grid I also, I think, would echo some of the comments that were made in last week's session with things like the warm home discount, which is a flat rate discount that's paid to all households. 
everyone recognises that energy costs more in the countryside. So you would want there should surely is some some um, flexibility or rationale for flexing the warm home discount to to recognise the fact that energy costs are more expensive in the countryside. Okay, Could, but do you agree with the wisdom of setting the fuel poverty target? Oh, absolutely. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. What about the length of the target from? You know, now till 2040, 2019 to 2040, uh, and the reason the government's reason for choosing this longer target period. What's your views on that? Target, you either you pick a date that you know you've got that you know you've got the resources to achieve the target by that date, or if you pick, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about an earlier date, then that will have an impact. Surely, will have an impact on resources and would require more resources. It comes down to where, how much money is available, how much. You, how much of a priority it is for government, and then how much resource it's, it's able or you know should put towards that. Okay, and so therefore, do you support it or? It's a well, in our emotionally, you, 2040 seems like a long way out. But given that there was a statutory target to eliminate it by 2016, we got nowhere near it. Yeah. I can understand nervousness about being sort of brave again. Brave, that sounds like a yes minister response, <laughs> but, uh, Mr Armstrong. I'll try yeah. not to be. I mean, I, I, I echo a lot, a lot of what Paul said there. I, I think it is important to um, be realistic in these things, but it's also important to be ambitious and to set a target that you know makes clear that there's a commitment to do this in the right way. But I think the date is almost a secondary consideration to, if I were writing a business plan out to 2040, the date would be one element, but the resources and the means of achieving the target within the time frame would be the important element that people would focus on. They would say, well, you've chosen 2032, you've chosen 2040, you've chosen that date, that's fine, but have you resourced it? Have you got a plan that is properly resourced to get there within the time that you're setting yourself? So the date is important, but showing that you have the means to achieve your target by a, a sort of fully resourced business plan is equally important. And the other thing that sits alongside this, of course, is Energy Efficient Scotland is being developed with dates and targets and milestones and things like that. So I think it's important that the two go hand in hand and there's coordination as those two various roadmaps unfold. OK, thank you. Mr Michael? We'd certainly support bringing forward the target. Um, we haven't specified a specific date, but I do acknowledge that the Scottish Government's Fuel Poverty Advisory Board has suggested 2032. Completely, completely echo Mr Armstrong's points around making sure there's a clear plan. I think I said earlier on there's a, there's a clear plan in meeting that and setting that forward. But also that there are meaningful and regular milestones um, going up to 2032. I think, I think the importance of bringing it earlier also means that we, it can concentrate minds. We can look at meeting it earlier means people start thinking about it quicker and finding quicker ways to deliver it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you would say that they should bring it forward? And you would say that they should put in milestones. What happens then if those milestones are showing that 2040 was actually the more realistic target and not 2032? Well, I think there'd have to be a matter for, you know, there were so many bodies involved in delivering fuel poverty and, 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 and trying to fight against it and, and reduce it. So I think they'd have to come together. I note the bill does say working with, you know, there'd be energy companies to work with local authorities, the Scottish Government organisations, you know, charities that come together. You know, there are new and innovations that are coming in that will deliver that as well. I think there'll be a big challenge. This is an ambitious plan, yes, and making it 2032 makes it a bit more ambitious, yeah. but it concentrates minds it will deliver it earlier. OK, right. Thank you very much. The, the government's rationale for a 5% target rather than a 0% target, where do you stand on that? Do you yeah, a sensible position. I think for me, what's interesting is that the previous target um, was couched in these words as far as reasonably practicable. And for me, that was a, a, a more logical way of doing it. Because, you know, 5% is an arbitrary number, as far as I'm aware. 4% is an arbitrary number, 7% is an arbitrary number, 10%. As far as reasonably practicable, recognise that fuel poverty is a, a difficult thing to pin down. People move in and out of fuel poverty often, you know, on a daily basis as circumstances change. So if we say 5% and on the, you know, the target date in 2040, we've reached 5%, well, the, the following day, it might be 5.5%, it might be 6%, because there might be some increase in fuel prices that's announced the next day that pushes another 5,000 people into fuel poverty. So I think for me, I, I, I felt it was more helpful to say, well, 
we, we the previous talk was about eradicating fuel poverty as far as reasonably practicable, which is kind of saying zero percent, but it isn't really because it's recognising the innate complexities of landing the helicopter on the two pence piece. It's kind of saying, look, we'll we'll do our best to eradicate it as far as reasonably practicable without... And I think this 5% thing is almost a, a substitute for that, whereas for me, I felt that the kind of aiming for an eradication is a bolder statement of ambitious policy, but couching it in that, you know, um, language around... E as far except as can. That that's what the Scottish executive did, and uh, they could probably say that we achieved it as far as reasonably practical, which means that they made absolutely no, you know... They, they, they made no grounds on it whatsoever. So, do you not think? And you heard the officers saying that the targets are very important for for people to work towards. So, I would. I, I mean, I don't know the government's thinking in this, but I, do you think that it's possible that that was part of the reason why they they set a target because it's something for for people to work towards? Yeah, no, and I I agree that the target should be in place. But I think if you have the target as our ambition is to eradicate fuel poverty. That is a, a bolder statement to make than, you know, we'll try and get to a 5% number. Yeah, OK, thank you. Uh, Mr Mark. I, I think the point echoed by the councils was, was, a, was an important one. T having targets is really important to meet. I think having an overall ambition, a really ambitious target for eradicating all fuel poverty, if the Scottish Government was to do that, it'd have to be very, very, very clear on how it's going to deliver that and how that is going to be financed. Yeah. But we also heard that the... You can't really get zero because of individual circumstances where people move. And, yeah. Uh, you know, you might lose your job before exactly. the benefits set in yeah. or whatever. So, OK. Uh, sorry, Mr Blackwell. No. All right, thank you. Um, Andy, you wanted to come in at this point? Just on that question of eradication, I mean, the dictionary definition of eradication is to put an end to it. You know, a disease has been eradicated. You can't eradicate something as far as practically possible. You either eradicate it or you don't eradicate it. It is a black and white word. Um, so given that there's an acceptance that there will always be a bit of fuel poverty, should we eradicate the word eradication from the bill? <laughs> it's a serious point because you... I mean, it, it says an act of the Scottish Parliament set a target relating to their eradication and then it goes on to set a target for reducing it. We'll maybe leave that for further debate. But the, the, the point you made, uh, Ross, was a very important one, I think, about the reasonably practicable. And I just wonder, just following up on that, do you think there should be, in association with a target of, say, 5%, there should be some language in the bill that makes it clear that that is a moving target? I mean, would the milestones help with that, for example? Yeah, I think milestones will, will, would, would help with that, yeah. And I, I think between now and 2040, the macroeconomic picture is going to change substantially. You know, we're all aware of certain factors that will influence in some way the macroeconomic position um, for, for the next 22 years, between now and the target date. So I think there's got to be some sort of recognition built in that, you know, to an extent, as you say, it'll be a moving feast. So the, the milestones and the kind of... There, there was a point made last week about parliamentary scrutiny and, and Parliament's involvement in scrutinising progress, and I think that would help uh, tied in with the milestones to to ensure that targets were um, being properly tracked. We'll, we'll look at that in a moment, yeah. Thanks. Good minute. OK, thank you. Annabelle, you wanted to come in So we're just looking at the, the two issues together. I mean, as I, uh, a point I made in the earlier evidence session, obviously this Parliament does not control all the levers here, uh, and therefore... Um, in setting uh, the, the, the target in terms of the date and the threshold, presumably that reflects that very key fact that, uh, you know, unlike Westminster in terms of, of, of powers held, we don't have all the powers that we would need to uh, take control of this issue 100%. So presumably, therefore, the, 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 the language in the bill as currently drafted reflects that reality, does it not? I mean, yeah, from from my standpoint, there's, I I agree that the there isn't control over all of the drivers in totality. So perhaps the five percent has been drafted with that in mind. I just kind of I have the sense that it's possible to be a bit more ambitious and say, well, as far as reasonably practical, the words that I used earlier would still cover the the point that you raised there along the lines of well, within best endeavours and with all the levers available to the parliament and to the government, 
every effort was made to get down to the zero level. And it, it covers the same eventuality, but I, I guess you do need that get out clause around this government doesn't have access to all of the levers that will drive your poverty. It's just what form that takes. Okay, thank you. Kenny? Yeah, in terms of um, ambition to reduce to 5%, I mean, just at the tail end of the last evidence session, you'll have heard um, them say that there's a real issue about, you know, to get the numbers down, you, you tackle fuel poverty on the margins. When the, when the, an actual fact is people have got real deep-seated poverty, we should uh, fuel poverty we should be tackling first, but of course this don't necessarily make the figures look particularly good. How do we address that? And the 5% target, there's 32 local authorities in Scotland, should they all have a 5% target? Because places like East Renfrewshire are much more prosperous than neighbouring Glasgow, and Glasgow will be a much more momentous task to reduce it for some of the reasons we heard in the previous session than in East Renfrewshire, which is relatively prosperous. So how do we ensure that we have an equitable... Um, how we address this equitably across um, Scotland? And I'll go on to rural in a minute. So, can we want to answer that one? Mr Markle, you were very animated in the audience earlier on. You were nodding and, you know, I felt as if, you know... You've really got a lot to say, so would you like to kick off on this one? <laughs> Thank There's you. the dangers of audience participation <laughs> right there. <laughs> um, there's, there's so many, if, if we look at extreme poverty um, and extreme fuel poverty, there's so many different, different aspects that drive extreme fuel poverty. And you can eliminate fuel poverty, but you'll, I, I, I imagine that person will still be in extreme poverty because mm -hmm. you eliminate one part of it, but there's so many different parts of aspects of that person's life. Now, there are, you know, energy companies themselves take very sort of different views on how they approach, and many of them un take undertake individual programmes. You know, I actually heard from one the other day, Utilita, who um, are undertaking with Citizens Advice Scotland, of going around um, to different councils and working with different councils and getting their local um, getting their customers in and talking about energy efficiency and how they can actually help them to reduce their energy efficiency. And actually, Utilita are a company that about 92-95% of their customers are on smart meters, um, smart prepayment meters, actually. Um, you know, w one thing I would say is if we're looking to the future, if, if, if the target is brought down to 2032, if the target stays as 2040, we will be living in a very different energy world by that time. We'll have new innovations, we'll have new technologies. The smart metering programme will have finished, we'll have smart meters in every property in Great Britain. And what we are seeing through smart metering is a completely new way of delivering energy services to customers. And I'll, I'll give you an example. Actually, again, Utilita. Um, during the beast from the east, Utilita found that around, I think it was about 200,000 of their customers um, I actually know it's about 25,000 of their customers actually self-disconnected. Um, and so Utilita um, credited their accounts to make sure, personally, to make sure that they could afford energy and they could put their lights on during the beast from the east. And that is a completely different new way of providing services to customers, often the most vulnerable customers, to make sure that they can continue to keep their um, lights on, continue to heat their property. So I think there are different approaches different councils can make, but also energy companies are taking that approach as well. I mean, I think that was a really good answer to a question I didn't ask. You should actually be sitting probably on the committee here rather than over there. The, the, oh, what I'm trying to find out is how we actually ensure that this, we, we deal with this equitably across the country for the reasons I suggested. Some local authorities are much more prosperous than others and have a, some have a bigger problem than others. So how do we address this directly? Um, anyway, I mean, Mr Armstrong, you want to come in here? Yeah, so, I mean, if I could pick up. So the, the programme that Walmart runs is Warmer Home Scotland, which is the Scottish Government's national fuel poverty programme, goes across all of Scotland, yeah. and it's demand-led. So today our programme might get half a dozen referrals in Shetland and 20 referrals in Stranra and 20 referrals in IMATH. I don't know where the referrals are coming in. So it's affect geography blind it follows need yeah. so i think one of the important things that the government has to do is ensure that national instruments as part of the fuel poverty strategy are properly set up and incentivized to target where need exists so our contract with the government has been set up in a very specific way to ensure that we go where need presents itself so just under a fifth of all of the work we do is in the highlands and islands for example areas that will have some of the worst levels of fuel poverty whereas in terms of population that's probably disproportionately skewed towards those areas where need for warmth and affordable warmth is clearly greater. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily we've cracked it, but I think more of our activity on a national level comes where need is greater. So I think the government should kind of le learn from the lessons that 
we, we kind of have seen over the last three years of our program, where you can clearly direct help to where it is needed most if your contract, your key performance indicators, all of the targets that we have to hit and report on a monthly basis are properly set up to tackle the areas where need is greatest because there's no value in the national mm. scheme simply sitting changing gas boilers in the central bent of Scotland. Yeah. The national scheme has to be a national scheme yeah. and has to go where need presents itself. So I think government can get the policy levers right. It is possible to target help to areas where need is greatest. Yeah. So, so we work in partnership with local authorities, but we focus where need is greatest and we focus resources where need is greatest. But the other point I I'm asked was, what about these, how do we deal with these very difficult um, hard to heat properties, which are the ones that have kind of plagued us for years? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was in the 99, 2003 parliament, and we were discussing it then, and nearly 20 years later, we're still discussing it. How, how do we ensure that those areas are prioritised within this when we've got a target-driven system based on you know, the number of households being reduced as opposed to, within, for example, specific categories? I think what one of the things that's important from, from our point of view is that the range of measures and improvements that you have in your tool bag has to be broad enough to serve the harder to treat properties. Because again, there's no point just switching out gas boilers in non-gas areas. We have to um, go with technologies such as external wall insulation, internal wall insulation, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps. Some of the new measures that the government's introduced on our program are going to help us tackle these pockets of harder to treat properties, but they do need greater investment on a per property basis. So there's always that trade-off between we can probably apply the technologies that we need to apply, but if you have a limited budget, that means that you do fewer homes overall, and that's for ministers to decide. Ms Chisnell, Chisnell wants to come in. It was, it was when you were talking there about how do we best target, um, I mean, there's a massive amount of data out there owned or used by different organisations. I mean, obviously, local authorities have got a massive amount at their disposal, as do uh, social housing organisations. But we've also got powers under the Digital Economy Act whereby we are trying, and the Scottish Government obviously has a, a big digital directorate looking at how do we make better use of that information, mm -hmm. obviously under the terms of, of new data protection. <coughs> but better, sh better sharing of that data is going to be absolutely critical if we're really going to see proper targeting. And as you say, it, it's not just about how many people fall into that category. It's also the type of property. But smart metering, as, as Simon's just alluded to, can actually provide a huge amount of information about people's actual needs on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't want to steal his example about Gladys maybe not getting up and, and boiling her kettle, so I'll let Simon do it. But there are ways that if we could make better use of that data, make better use of the powers we already have under the Digital Powers Act, could certainly better target where we actually apply things first, rather than just looking at the geography. Yes, I see some of that in your evidence, actually, you've said that. I mean, I'm quite happy to, 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 to ask the real questions later and let other members in the yeah, meeting, yeah, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, that's well Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we talk about ambition, and I think you've, you've all explained what the ambition uh, and the ability to achieve that ambition. And from what we heard earlier on was that some of the councils uh, are struggling to maybe achieve that ambition in the long term. Uh, in the short term and the medium term, they have an opportunity to achieve that. So what do you think they should be doing differently? Uh, and is it just down to funding? because they indicated that the, the, the grants and the, and the resources available uh, are a major player in that process, or are there other ways that we should be working collectively in partnership to try and manage the situation across the areas that are more difficult to achieve? Does anybody wish to answer that? I can come in. Our, our programme is a national programme, and obviously the locally area-based delivered programmes work slightly differently on a local authority by local authority basis. And the other thing I would add is kind of we have to recognise the limitations of local authority delivery. And I say that with all the kind of understanding of the value of local authority delivery and what it can bring. But local authorities have many priorities and the butter is spread quite thin across the bread. So I think we have to recognise that with local authority delivery, some councils will be better resourced and more focused and have individuals within that authority that are quite... You know, committed to the policy area, other councils will have number of priorities and maybe not necessarily have the ability to give the same resource and focus to the policy area. So it's not quite an answer to the question of what can councils do differently, but it is kind of a contextual point around local authority delivery generally having its limitations. The point about 
local delivery or national delivery. These things are never a, an either or discussion. They're always an and. We need local delivery and national delivery. And the question should maybe be, how can we join those up and, and make sure that you get some economies of scale by um, joining the two up? Because if, if, if you don't achieve that, then as I say, there's going to be a huge disparity across locations and parts of Scotland that will manage to meet target and will be focused on that and others that will fall well short of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and as I say, the, and that will have an impact on the whole goal of achieving the, the timescale uh, that, we, that we're trying to achieve in, 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 in the long term. I agree. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I like ask in terms of funding for the, the last evidence session, there seems to be a lot of different grants and different funding there. Is there is there something that can be done to make that funding easier to access, uh, more transparent? Is you know, is, is or is it the way it's set up? Do you think that's that's okay? Uh, sorry, I feel like I'm diving in. Um, I, I mean, this is an area that's quite close to our heart. Obviously, the national scheme. We, we're funded by central government on an annual basis on a contract that runs for up to seven years. And access to the national scheme is relatively straightforward. It's through Home Energy Scotland. The local authority grants um, area and the applications for area-based schemes, again, authorities set out, but then delivery is left to local authorities to decide how they want to administer that from, from there on out. So um, I guess that's one for the, for the local authorities to answer about what more could be done to maybe make the area-based scheme delivery um, more accessible. But certainly on the on terms of the national scheme, our budget is confirmed annually by the Scottish Government and then we have 12 months to um, service the demand that's out there and spend the budget. But it's it's a bit more straightforward on the national scheme level. OK, thank you. Andy Wayman. Um, thanks very much uh, indeed. Um, I was interested in your earlier point, Sarah, about uh, data, and that was a point that was also raised by a panel of previous witnesses, because the new definition is quite a complicated definition. I don't think there's any, any way in which that could be used directly to target support, the idea of being able to identify which households fall into that definition individually, I think, is a bit, bit challenging. So what kinds of data are you talking about? How easy do you think it will be um, to integrate that data better and within what timescales? I'm asking for a realistic assessment here because in many areas of public policy, people say, well, let's just use and share data, but it, for a variety of reasons, never happens. I'm not a data expert, um, but I, I mean, I know simply from talking to people who are in the digital directorate how big a process this is at the moment of trying to make through the myriads of different data sets that different, particularly public organisations, access. So the government itself has got numerous different sets of data. It's then got different agencies who obviously report to the government and to Scottish Parliament who are using a completely different set. So it is years off. Um, I'd probably li like to allow Simon to answer, though, particularly in smart metering, because that takes us to a completely different level of the type of information which can give you a picture of how somebody uses energy on a day-to-day -day basis. And it, it then will be a challenge to see how could we start to match that with what public agencies already hold on different households. So, so just before Simon comes in, so you said years off. So which bits of data are not years off? Where could we, where could we reasonably make some progress in a, in, within two or three years? Well, actually, on the, on the Sarah talked about the Digital Economy Act 2015 that's passed in the UK Parliament. That had a really important and really quite, quite useful piece of re regulation in it that would allow energy companies and the government to be able to share data on vulnerable customers. And that was based on often benefits, claimants, people like that, that actually meant... And one of the biggest problems of fuel poverty is how do we identify who are the most vulnerable? In the system we currently have, how do you identify? In the meters, so talking about the future and smart metering, smart metering will, will allow us that data. So you talk to companies that are being set up and innovations that are being created on the back of smart metering. There are a number of companies now that can say, actually, we're using smart meters to be able to target social care better. We're using smart meters to be able to know how we can get somebody home to a warmer house out of hospital. So the good example I have is that well, there was one company, and there are actually uh, uh, energy companies as well looking at this and their smart the, the data they get from their smart meters, saying, look, you know, we've got Gladys 
she's a um, your home help. You pick, you wake up in the morning, you get your iPad or your tablet, and you look across the ten people you've got to go and see that morning. Gladys, she's boiled a kettle. She's up and about. She's absolutely fine. I don't know. I don't need to go and see her. We got Bob. He hasn't boiled his kettle. He's not moving around. His energy's not on. He's normally up by nine. I need to go and see him straight away. And actually, we've got Joan. She's She's boiled her kettle 20 times in the last hour. She's either really thirsty or she's actually got the early onset of Alzheimer's. And actually, that's how you can start using it. The future of energy, the future that we'll have from smart metering will allow us to not just look at energy, but how we also provide health services and, and social care and all these other issues that we, we don't have that data at the moment. So a smart meter can, can tell a remote person when someone has boiled a kettle... Specific, a specific appliance? Yeah. A smart meter can also tell you how many people are in the room. That's if you want them. You know, again, there's, there's, um, there's um, you know, you have those are data protection issues. You have to do that across. But, you know, we should have left out that last bit. There was another one that I heard where there was a, where often social housing, they will put, you, you've got maybe a, a customer who, or a, a tenant who, living in ha- social housing, often elderly, dementia, um, you obviously want to keep them in their house or a, a sort of assisted living home. Um, there was one story we were told where there was a man who, um, who sort of would boil, put, turn on his, turn on his um, toaster quite a few times. Problem was he would often choke from chewing on toast. So every time he put his toaster on, they would go in, turn his toaster off. It will absolutely revolutionise the way we use energy. But wait a minute, how, how, how do you tell when someone switched a kettle on? Because if a kettle is plugged into a three-pin plug, you could plug that in any plug in the house. How do you know it's a kettle? Because you, the spike will go up and you can know how much energy ah, it's so it's just uses. about the energy. So that could be yeah. for something else, though. Or are you saying the spike has got a particular signature the spike's got, well, the associated? Spike, the, spike, the spike you'll be able to tell. You'll be able to tell, yeah. like, there's the spike of energy. Because, you know, one thing, I don't know if anybody's got a smart meter, but when you, when you boil your kettle, your smart meter will go, ting, it will shoot up. Yeah, no, I'm aware um, of that. OK, so these are lots of interesting stories, but let's get back to the... Uh, point of fuel poverty. I mean, how realistic is it? I mean, I don't know where smart meters are in terms of rollout and implementation and all the rest of it. You could perhaps tell us. Um, but how realistic is it that the data, let's say, that's captured by smart meters can make a, contrib- a significant contribution to targeting support and fuel poverty? Just that specific question. I think it's quite significant. Within what kind of time scale? Um, well, we're already seeing it now, but you know the rollout of the top smart meeting program will finish in 2020. Companies are committed to delivering that, so hopefully sometime between now and 2020. And have you got any case studies or research that's been done that show the extent to which smart meters can give us good quality information on who's in fuel poverty or not? I can certainly go away and see if we can find that data for you. That, that, that yeah. would be useful. Certainly. Some examples for the committee, I think, would be yeah, very, very helpful yeah. because we will be looking at implementation. It's not specifically in the bill, but the reason we've asked people about their views on the strategy is because we believe that targets have to be associated with the pathway to, 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 to getting there. Thank you. Cool. Can, can, can you put a very quick on that? I mean, I think it's a very interesting conversation, obviously alarming, I suppose, in certain senses of the reach of the smart meter, but obviously a lot of potential uh, uses for the benefit of, of uh, vulnerable people. Um, but I think uh, it was Sarah that alluded to the other side of that coin, which is the issue of data protection. And I just wonder where those two issues are currently meeting at the moment, because obviously there's potential there, but there will be uh, restraints on, on, well, on sharing. So where is that debate currently? Yeah, obviously, any sharing of data from smart meters um, would be based on, you know, current data protection legislation. Um, you know, and would sp- that then render it all the potential good you've talked about? Would that then sort of uh, negate to, to a significant extent the, the potential use of the the data? No, not necessarily at all. Because then you could you could decide whether or not you want what information you want to share with either your energy company or others. Okay. okay. It will be about how consent works. And obviously people are being made fully aware um, about what they're signing up to and how people will be able to use their smart meter. People can make that decision when they have it fitted. Um, Obviously, when you're looking at social care situations, and some of this is already being used by housing association providers and in a care setting already. But as Simon says, with the rollout and and the obligation that companies have to roll it out by 2020, we now are quite near to that point where it should, every, every household should have the access to a smart meter. And so that will, it will completely change 
what we can use and how we can use it. Um, but yes, I mean, consent will be a very important part of that. Thank you. Thank you. Liam? Thanks. Thanks, convener. Um, we, we asked you all um, what your views are on the um, revised definition of fuel poverty. Um, so there's a lot to talk about there, clearly. But in, in, in Warmworks' submission, um, you say that fuel poverty proofing homes at risk is more valuable than allowing assistance to be delivered purely on the basis of a snapshot in time. Um, so I wonder if you could uh, explain a bit about what, what you mean by that. You also um, mentioned, it's been mentioned earlier, the use of proxies. That was never really explained for anyone who's watching what that means. Yeah, so, um, the snapshot and time point is interesting. So the fuel poverty definition, I think it's all been referenced, is a, is a complex definition, and rightly so, because it's a complex issue. But the fact of its complexity means that it is a statistical construct, right? So it, a bunch of very capable academics have come up with a definition, and we understand what that journey is and why the definition is important. But on the doorstep, and to people in fuel poverty, the definition is meaningless because they're cold and they can't afford to be warm. And that's the primary policy driver here. So for us, I think it's time and money are precious resources and time and money are limited because we have to get to 2040 or 2032 or whatever point in time we decide. And we only have a limited amount of time and money to get there. So for us, I think what we're trying to do is say, look, we recognize that the definition is important, but the more time we spend and the more resources we spend on trying to perfectly target precisely only on those homes that meet the requirements of that statistical construct on the day that we knocked on the door is not good policy from our standpoint. The better policy approach is to say that fuel poverty proofing households, or as far as reasonably practical, and taking households to a point where they can withstand losing their job or having benefits reduced or losing family members through bereavement or changes in fuel prices, these all of these impacts that will change somebody's status under the guise of that statistical construct can be if not completely insulated against forgive the pun with with withstood to a degree by taking the house to the greatest possible level of energy efficiency that we can do at a reasonable in a reasonable way by checking that the household receives all of the benefits to which they're entitled by checking that the household is on the best available tariff and giving them the support they need to navigate the energy market to get to the most competitive tariff. These are steps that can be taken to protect a household against um, some of those factors that can change in their lives. Because one thing we know about households in fuel poverty is that they often live chaotic lifestyles. That's the reality. And they are very sensitive to changes in economic fuel prices or their own personal economic circumstances. So I think what we're referring to in the definition is in, in our evidence, sorry, is the, the definition is a statistical construct, but it represents a snapshot in time. Mm -hmm. So if we were to say we would take all those steps to fuel poverty proof a household, under the old definition, if that household had been spending 9% of its income on fuel rather than 10%, it wouldn't have been fuel poor at that moment in time. But would that have been bad policy to fuel poverty proof that household? Absolutely not. So I think what the, the point we were trying to make was that the definition is important, but the definition in this context is a complex statistical construct. And what matters to the householder who is cold and can't afford to be warm is what are we going to do in terms of delivery? How are we going to change their lives in a meaningful way to fuel poverty-proof that household? I'm quite quiet because I've been waiting for the rural bit. Um, oh, that's commonly. It's, it's, I know it's, it's, coming coming it's coming up. Um, it's coming up. And you've got, you've got real experts here. In terms of... We didn't have a lot to say in terms of the definition, other than I think it's right. We believe it's right that it's more close, cl closely defined. But I do share Mr. Whiteman's concerns around data, um, because you need to be confident that you define it in such a way that it is measurable, mm -hmm. and that you've got access to that data within a reasonable time frame. From what we've seen, certainly in terms of data on fuel poverty from a rural context, is we've been trying to establish how much work, how many measures have been delivered in rural or off-gas grid areas. And we've had to go through freedom of information requests, not in terms of the Scottish Government, that was with Ofgem, um, but in terms of we've been trying to get inside the delivery within the HEAPS ABS schemes. And again, 
the data is just not there to show what has been delivered into rural off-grid areas versus urban areas. So data is an issue, not just in terms of targeting, but also in terms of measuring performance and in terms of measuring the impact that you're having. One thing we would encourage the Scottish Government certainly to do when looking at the definition is to certainly is, is one is to make it as simple as possible to identify these people. That then has a knock-on effect to make it as simple as possible to then find target them with the right amount of help, maybe it's energy deficiency, Scottish energy deficiency programmes, things like that, yeah. eco warming disco, things like that. But also whether or not it's worth looking at um, the minimum income standards that they're using in the bill at the moment, whether or not that should actually be made a Scottish, a developer Scottish minimum income standard. The UK minimum income standard looks specifically across the whole of the UK. And actually having a Scottish minimum income standard would take account of some of the unique geography, landscapes, properties that you actually have up here in Scotland, different than across the sort of averaging it across the whole of the UK and I, I think you've got the expert who developed the minimum income standard in next week so I'm sure he'll have some and his evidence certainly has some ideas about how you can do that. Okay uh, I guess that takes us neatly into uh, the, the rural question which Mr Gibson will have a, a lot to say but uh, now is your opportunity to kick things off um, what what you think on that? In terms of well um, Mr Markle the rural questions okay. and deal with them all at once. I think that would make more well, sense. Well, you mentioned yeah. the Scottish uh, yeah, minimum well, income standard. Yeah, but we could bring that in at that time. I'm not, try I'm not trying now. to cut you off. Okay. But, uh, but uh, Kenny can bring it in when, when we're talking about the rule, just so we can get it all together. Okay. Thank you. And I'm going to do that later on. Uh, Annabelle? Yes, that's, <laughs> this is a new look for you, uh, Annabelle. <laughs> um, okay, so on a, a, a different issue, um, uh, the uh, provisions in the bill regarding reporting. So uh, the current position is a proposed five-year reporting period, and just wanted to hear uh, if you have any views on on that, on the frequency of of that reporting requirement. It seems not to be enough. Give, if you could take a 2040 target, what is that? Eight, in the space of 20 years, you're talking about four reports or five reports. And uh, I think something which, given that from what we heard from the earlier session, that you've got data, some of the data available on an annual basis, that you have got the, the opportunity to, to sort of measure performance a bit more regularly. And I think it's in terms of if you know, get to five years and find out you're nowhere near, it's far better off that you're, you're capturing that earlier on in the process. So at least you can sort of steer the ship or whatever it is you're driving in, in the, towards your targeted where you want to go. So what period would you propose, if not five? A years? shorter one. Shorter. <laughs> <laughs> you should be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mark? I don't think I'm going to be able to give you a, um, a specific other sort of year other than five. What I would say is I think it's really important to make sure that we have meaningful and regular health checks on how this is being delivered. Um, whether that's five years, whether that's three years, I, you know, we wouldn't have an opinion on, but we need to make sure it's being delivered. We need to make sure that we can continue to focus on those people who most need this help getting it. And if the first year is actually we're targeting the most vulnerable people, then great. And each report needs to be looking at what's been done in either the five or three years previous, but also what's going to be done in the future. And then that's how you also can focus on what new technologies and new innovations have come in in that period in between each report. And so you can keep tweaking, you can keep looking and you can keep focusing on the next period. Thank you. In terms of the substance of uh, such reporting, um, as I had mentioned in the previous evidence session, uh, Cass had suggested that the uh, report included progress uh, with regard to each of the, uh, the drivers fuel poverty of the, the four drivers um, being energy prices, household income, energy efficiency and uh, behaviour of the, the consumer. Um, so is that something that you, you would agree with Cas on? I mean, notwithstanding uh, the, the key issue in regard to two of those drivers, that the power doesn't lie here. And therefore, you know, a report can take you so far. But if you don't actually control the levers of power, you, you're a wee bit um, hamstrung as to what you can do. Any thoughts on, on the substance of the report? I think that seems sensible. If they're, they're the drivers of fuel poverty and the 
each of the health checks will be about how you're meeting the fuel poverty strategy, so that seems sensible. Even if you you make the exactly fair point that in some respects you haven't got the powers mm -hmm. on things like energy prices. Yeah, I mean, I think there's an important point here around around balance. I think it would be easy to to sit and say, look, the annual reporting is 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 key, and regular reports on each of the milestones and getting down into detail is really important. I think for me, balance is important though because the more time we spend on um, review and reporting and monitoring and recommendations and following up on recommendations and closing out recommendations, it can take away from our ability to get on with delivery. So I absolutely agree that you know it's important to get the right monitoring and reporting framework. Um, actually, the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel is full of you know high quality industry experts who will have a really important role to play in terms of holding government accountable. Um, and I think they they should kind of have a an important role in that. But I, I would I guess just send a little note of caution to say we 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 shouldn't necessarily go too far down the road of devising lots and lots of um, onerous reporting regimes that detract from the time and money we have available to get on with delivery. I don't think the fact that you can't control something doesn't mean you shouldn't measure it. So the fact that you can't control it, you still have the visibility in terms of the impacts, the relative impacts that different drivers are having. So I think you, you need to measure it. You, you, you can't obviously target it, but you can measure it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back. Thank you very much, Andy. Uh, yeah, following up from that um, uh, reporting um, question, the bill makes provision that ministers shall lay these reports every five years until 2040, which uh, is a useful thing to do. But we have, we have other legislation like the Child Poverty and Climate Change Acts, which include independent scrutiny, um, independent um, advice, etc. You've mentioned the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel. What scope do you think there is to strengthen the reporting and scrutiny provisions in this bill to ensure that the lessons we learn about progress made are provided in a, um, a you know an effective and impartial way? I mean, I think you've, you've referenced a couple of really good examples there around other legislation and how independent experts and panels are holding government to account and have um, mechanisms in place to, to monitor progress. And I think the Fuel Poverty Advisory Panel should be looked at as an ideal instrument to to make that happen and and to be to making that accountability happen. I think that they could play a similar role to some of the other examples that you've mentioned in the context of this reporting framework. So just to be clear, it's none of them hold government directly to account. That's our job well, in, sorry, in Parliament. Yeah, um, but they provide independent scrutiny, yeah. independent reporting, so that the job of everybody, yourselves. Parliament, local authorities, delivery partners, is made that little bit easier. Uh, views from the rest of the panel on that question, if I, you have them. I would, I would only echo um, what Mr. Armstrong said. That it, that seems sensible. Um, NGK's chief executive, Lawrence Slade, actually sits on the Fuel Poverty Commission for the Scottish Government. Um, he's he doesn't pack his punches when he wants to tell governments where he thinks that they could do better, or um, certainly focus on different things. So yeah, it seems perfect fun. Okay. And Terence, you feel that that gives you um, that independent insight, gives you sort of much more power, but also that sort of objective view, then it's it's then about finding an appropriate body, which by the sounds of it, there is one, but it's then about resource, whether they're, they're able to do it. Sure. I just had a brief question on um, something that's often neglected, but every bill has got commencement provisions, which say when the bill shall come into force. And the commencement provisions here are laid out in section 13, Section 14 says what the short title of the Act is, and the commencement provisions in Section 13 say that this section and Section 14, that's the title, come into force on the day after royal assent. Everything else comes into force when government decides it comes into force. Do you, do you think we should be looking to placing statutory um, uh, uh, provisions in relationship to when the different provisions in this bill come into force, or do you think we should leave that to ministers? And that's what I would say that's one for you guys, but if you've got an end date, whether it's 2032, 2040, I would have thought you'd want, you'd want confidence that things were going to be put in place with sufficient speed that you, you've got some chance of hitting those targets. We'll take that on. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Andy. Uh, Graham, you wanted to come back in on, on a couple of issues? Um, just a question asked earlier in the previous session about the draft strategy. 
um, criticism that it lacks uh, detail. I wonder what your comments are on that. Um, as I said before, you know, we think energy efficiency is absolutely key to how we can tackle and how we can really get on top of fuel poverty. Um, I'm really pleased that in the strategy it really does major on energy efficiency. But one thing I think I would like to see is Scotland has a real opportunity right now. We've got the fuel poverty bill and the fuel poverty strategy coming out of that. We've got the route map for energy efficiency and the possible energy efficiency bill coming next year. You've got the planning bill and the climate change bill. There's a real opportunity across all these strategies, across all these pieces of legislation for Scotland to get this right. And actually each one of those bits look at energy holistically because each one of those things can support the other in delivering its aims. And that's why I would say this strategy, and within this strategy, that's where that could be strengthened. The fact that within fuel poverty, if you tackle fuel poverty, you can increase energy efficiency. You can, one, keep people in warmer homes, keep them ha healthier and happier, but you can also contribute to reductions in climate, um, climate change and reductions in CO2 emissions. And that, that, that's where I think this strategy and some of the other strategies kind of lack that coherent, holistic approach. And this, this is a draft strategy, so I really think there's an opportunity that this strategy could be the first that could link with the route map to energy efficiency, which could then link with the energy efficiency bill, link with the climate change bill, which is obviously in its early stages, and really look at how Scotland could really crack this energy um, holistic view of en energy which would be amazing and really, um, really, you know, the NG sector would support. Do, do you think it lacks that, that linkage at the moment? I think it does lack that linkage at the moment. I think it's got the NG, I think it's got the NG efficiency bits in there, um, but it, I, I don't think it, you know, it does touch a bit on decarbonisation of heat, which is really good and a, a, an absolutely massive challenge for climate change as well. Um, but I would certainly, I do think there does need to be a linkage between all the different strategies we've got. Mm -hmm because they can support each other. And you know, we talked about fuel poverty on its own. It will not be delivered on its own by this bill. It will need all the other aspects of energy efficiency, planning, climate change, which will help deliver, uh, deliver this 5%. Um, I think one of the things, he touched on a point that I, that I made earlier, which is 2040, 2032, the dates are fine. The strategy in and, in and of itself is fine in terms of being a framework for action. But the next step is the difficult one, because if you write a business plan, you have to set out how that's going to be resourced. So the strategy and the target are part of the, the framework for action, that's fine. But the next question is, well, if that's the strategy and those are the goals and those are the target dates and those are the milestones... How are you going to resource it? So I know colleagues last week on the evidence session from Energy Action Scotland um, gave a figure around £200 million a year in terms of investment and energy efficiency activity in Scotland. There's, there's a number of figures out there that various third sector organisations have put together. But at some stage, you know, the strategy and the, the target has got to be supported by, well, this is what we want to do and this is how we propose to get there and how we propose to resource it. And I think that's the... The difficult question there's no issue i don't think anybody would disagree with mm -hmm. the goals and the, the the kind of means outlined to get there but i think the the meat of it if you like will come when we get into the question of how is it to be resourced so really you're looking for a a, a more detailed business plan if you like i think that's, a, that's the logical terms. next i think that's the logical next yeah. step yeah. when do you think that should come i think that's a uh, a, a one for government and probably for ministers to... to well, I'm, ask, I'm asking you, what well, do you think? As, as, as managing agent of a government programme, I have to be quite careful um, in terms of answering that one. I think ministers have got all sorts of competing priorities and things like that, but there, there's some bold targets and a very laudable strategy and a strategic intention here that's going to be set in legislation. So I'm sure parliamentarians will be asking ministers, well, we really support the strategy, but we want to see how you're going to get there. I think it saved your job. Mr. Just, we, just. We will have the minister in front of us, so we will have the opportunity for, to ask him those questions. Yes. Sarah, I'm, you wanted to come in. Sorry, oh, sorry Paul. Sorry, no, sorry, Paul. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we would fundam fundamentally disagree with um, the Energy UK position in terms of We've seen too many examples where fuel poverty targets have been conflated with um, renewables targets, carbon targets, energy efficiency targets. The worst example we had was, um, we can probably all remember the Green Deal and the fact it wasn't greatly successful, but the government, the UK government decided to try and give it a leg up 
and they came out with a Green Deal Home Improvement Fund, which was effectively a grant scheme to try and encourage people to take out green deals. And as part of that, you were able to, if you're going to use a green deal to buy a new boiler, you could get 300 quid off the cost of the boiler, except if you're on heating oil or LPG. And when we went to see the Bayes, I think it was a deck official at the time, um, officials as, as to why this was the case, he said that he didn't want anything to get in the way of, of achieving his renewables target. And we said, well, hang on a minute. These are, you know, everyone's recognised that fuel poverty is, is, is much deeper in the countryside but you're now excluding certain elements of a government scheme to people living in the countryside because you want, to hit, you want them to, to sort of help achieve your renewables target using technology which is going to cost them three to four times the cost of putting in a boiler. And he said, well, it's such a good deal. Why wouldn't anyone take it up? And, well, history tells us that it wasn't that good a deal. And so I think there should be an absolute focus on fuel poverty. I was part of a, a roundtable discussion at a think tank three, four months ago, and it was about fuel poverty, and then there was the, everyone was asked, on the scale of 1 to 10, with fuel poverty being 1 and carbon reduction being 10, uh, where do you think the emphasis should, should sit within a fuel poverty strategy? And the answer was 1.1, apart from one person who said that, well, obviously we need to address carbon as well, and people said yes, but, you know, and she then went on to say there'd been some really exciting work that had been done in terms of deep retrofit, and this was in Nottingham City Council. Um, but the person from Nottingham City Council was there, and she said, yes, it's, we've done a lot, but it's quite expensive. It's £70,000 a house. And so, and again, you have to question, there comes a stage where you spend money to get somebody's house up to a level when they can keep it warm. And from a carbon point of view, they might not actually start, they might not save energy, they might actually start using energy, because now they can actually keep the house warm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think I'd certainly... We would um, prefer to see some purity in terms of some real focus on achieving fuel poverty objectives rather than trying to, to cover three, four, or five other different areas. The one area, again, I don't want to jump in before the rural bit, but because of the woeful lack of any delivery on energy efficiency in rural areas, we would like to have seen something in the strategy that would start to mandate a fair proportion of work to be done in rural areas, which hasn't been done to date. Um, we've just um, been doing some work looking at what's been delivered through ECO in Scotland since 2013. And in terms of LPG and oil, oil houses, which account for probably 70% of the properties in off-grid areas, you've had 11,000 measures delivered since 2013, which is about half a percent of the measures that have been delivered in Scotland under ECO. So given that you've got 10, 12% of houses, off-grid rural areas, there's been of a chronic lack of delivery on energy efficiency for all, and uh, for understandable reasons because um, in terms of people were looking at the cost of delivery and, and again there's this tension between as soon as you go into the countryside it costs more money to do things and certainly when you start looking at resourcing local authorities and we I think there's going to be a discussion later on about the, the minimum income standard whether or not there should be a, a, a different one for rural areas delivering things in rural areas costs more money and that needs to be reflected in things like the area-based schemes. We also need to see beta, better data so we can actually monitor and measure delivery in those areas. Because, again, we're struggling to see exactly how much has been done into rural areas. So I think, within the, I think it's critical that this is a time where Scotland's got the opportunity to try and put some of that right in terms of making, trying to flex or trying... To, not that it should all be about the countryside, but it's, it's just about the countryside's turn to have the same level of support that we've seen in urban areas. As a Glasgow politician, that grieves me to I know. agree with you. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. So, um, I'm now worried what I, may, I, I might say might really annoy oh, no, no, the no. <laughs> I, I think what Simon said in terms of looking at things holistically is, is critical, and I don't think we can take them separately. I think it's good that we have a fuel poverty bill which is looking at that principle and, and putting that first and foremost um, in some areas. But the fact remains that the climate change plan and the bill and the Energy Scotland's energy efficiency programme both talk about fuel poverty targets. Um, I don't think we can talk about fuel poverty targets 
and, and looking at those without looking at energy efficiency targets. And, and, and we can't pretend that there isn't a climate change bill going to be considered uh, in this parliament. And we've set, Scotland has set itself incredibly tough targets on that as well. Um, and I think Simon said it in the first thing he said, that the less energy you use, that's the best way to get people out of fuel poverty, is making sure that those homes are actually equipped to do that at the same time as looking at how we seriously reduce emissions. Um, and things like you've just been considering the planning bill, obviously, and for my sins, I've had to follow that quite closely as well. And, you know, unless we have a planning system which also enables that renewable energy, it is going to be more and more difficult to decarbonise heat. So I think it is absolutely essential that politicians and the government can look at all those things and how they link together. Yeah, I'm a bit disappointed you didn't like a performance in the planning bill, but uh, Graham, do you want to come back in here? Uh, no, I'm loath to ask about uh, rural issues. Good, convenient. that's what I like to hear. <laughs> uh, I think at this point, then, I will bring in Kenny Gibson. And then well, I was just going to put my feet up and have a spliff, because the, the, um, the, the Mr. Zen Kenneth to have Gibson. kind of uh, answered all I was going to ask. I mean, I was actually going to mention, quote the word woeful, which you've actually put in your evidence, because it's a, a great word, but you've already mentioned that. And, I mean, you talk about... Uh, you've talked about quite passionately, Mr. Black, a lot about the bias towards urban areas. But what mechanisms do you think we can introduce here, uh, for example, to ensure that this uh, bias, uh, if it does exist, does not continue uh, with specific um, um, uh, consideration of a, a minimum income standard? How do you think we can really uh, define that? Because your recommendation basically says amend the fuel poverty bill to include a remote rural settlement definition with uh, uh, rural urban classification to better target energy efficiency schemes. So I'm just wondering if you can put a wee bit of meat on those bones and then I'd be quite keen to hear what other uh, colleagues on the panel okay. have to say. Well, we've been banging on about this since the beginning of this decade. Yeah. Um, going right back to, I can't remember the acronyms, there's so many flipping acronyms in this area, but there was one called CESP, the Community Energy Savings Programme, um, which was supposed to deliver energy savings at a community level. But within that, <laughs> you had to hit minimum levels of indices and multiple def deprivation at a postcode level, which was virtually in impossible to happen at a, rural, in, at a rural level because typically fuel poverty in, in rural areas is, is embedded within a, the wider population and it doesn't show up in, in sort of the IMD numbers. And then, so we didn't see any, I don't think we saw any off-grid CESP programmes. And then when we started looking at what was the predecessor to EcoCert, Again, there was virtually no delivery into rural areas because it was cheaper for people to hit, unfortunately, whether it's estates in Glasgow or, or Aberdeen or Dundee, where all the houses, you've got 500, 1,000 houses all built at the same time, all need a cavity doing, all need a loft doing, whatever it is. It's far easier and then easier to target, easier to hit those, as opposed to rooting around in the countryside trying to find the embedded fuel poverty. I fully accept that it's more difficult, but there comes a stage where it needs to happen. And that certainly we campaigned for a better, at least some sort of obligation in rural areas. And the, the Westminster came up with a definite that they would have a rural sub obligation. But I think it was mentioned uh, in the earlier session where rural was defined uh, for eco as settlements up to 10,000 uh, 10, people, which is a market town on grid. So um, largely the obligated suppliers were able to hit their rural sub obligations by not going anywhere near rural off-grid areas. Now, looking, so, now within the HEAP scheme, Scotland did a, 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 um, adopt the lower level, 3,000. Um, now, with there's been a transfer of powers in terms of Scotland has now got more powers over ECO and the rules within ECO, and what we would c certainly call for is that the government to look at applying that same level of measure, if not, or you can go even, go even more remote, depending on on how you want to target within the rules of the scheme. Okay, can I jump in there? Because, I mean, you know, remote, obviously, we can argue uh, uh, about what, def what the definition of remote is in terms of population, but would you suggest, for example, that remote should perhaps be defined as off-grid rather than the number of households, for example? Is that how you would define it? Because otherwise you could end up with a situation whereby you have some remote communities that are in actual fact on grid that are class and some that are, that are not, you know? So I'm just wondering how you would... It's, I mean, as soon as you get to definition. really, really remote, it's difficult. I mean, the Scottish Government has got uh, an eightfold urban-rural classification, of which six 
are six, seven, and eight. The bottom three are rural and at different levels of population. You've got to define it somehow. Um, and that's and, and certainly from our point of view, that would be a good starting point. Right. So, but, so, so hold on a second. So, so let me get this. So what you're saying is, good starting point would be say a minimum income standard should be differentiated for those off grid. Would you be happy with that? Right. What I'm saying, there's two. Th I wasn't talking about minimum income standard. Right. I'll start okay. with saying, so the what I'm talking here is about when you start looking at delivery of energy efficiency schemes, right. and there's a bit, big focus on energy efficiency within the fuel poverty strategy, that there is something the Scottish Government can do in terms of targeting that effort to make sure that a fair proportion of that happens in rural off-grid areas. Then in terms of the... Min Sorry, rural and island, I've got 6,000 island constituents, so just to... Oh. Make sure that that's included. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It's, it obviously includes the island. I mean, there's, yeah. there's been lots of comments around, I've seen about mm -hmm. island proofing. Yeah. Um, but again, I, I, I think, um, you know, whether the, the, you know, the same sort of rural proofing of the bill, um, whether that's being considered or whether that should be put in as well. Because okay. just to make sure you're covering okay. all aspects. Now, 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 Mr. Markle, you, you said earlier on that it should maybe be a Scottish definition of a uh, uh, minimum income standard, but obviously Scotland, as we've heard, there's you know, huge variances within Scotland. Would you, would you maybe think it would be better to have an urban and rural, remote rural island, stroke island split? Would that be a more uh, efficient way of doing it? Do you think? Um, I, I or think. Do you think? Is, do you think Scotland should just be treated in their own? No, I, th I think the reason we were calling for Scotland to have its own sort of minimum income standard because it does have very unique sort of landscape and geography, the highlands, the islands, and the the sort of just and as as. Um, but that's totally different for Glasgow. Maybe. But yeah, yeah, it very much is. But I think the point was that it would, that it would take account of Scotland's different landscapes than the rest of the UK and the different sort of makeup of it. If then that that was chosen, that there could be a Scot Scottish urban and a Scottish rural uh, minimum income standard, then we'd have no problem with that either. I think the point was trying to make sure that this bill was able to target those in the most fuel poor areas and those people who are the most fuel poor. And the best way to do that for Scotland would be to have a specific minimum in the, in, um, income standard, whether or not then that for Scotland is chosen by yourselves and by the Scottish Government to be a rural and urban issue. Um, standard, then I think that would be fine as well. But the principle is that we need to make sure we make it easy to identify people in fuel poverty. Yes, because you've called for it to be bespoke actually in the yeah. evidence too. And, and, and Ms Chisnell, um, uh, I'm just wondering um, what your view is basically on, on the, the, the issue of, because uh, you've talked about many households are off gas properties relying on fuel deliveries, costs reflect national average gas prices rather than local grid prices for Scotland. So obviously I take it you Got the uh, very similar position to Mr. Markle. Um, I, I would say, incidentally, that in terms of, uh, I disagree with Mr. Blacklock, and I do agree with you in terms of um, uh, a bit holistic um, you know, combination of the, of the legislation. I'm pretty sure the Scottish Government actually does want to blend the legislation so that it, it dots every I, crosses every T, and works together rather than against itself. So I'm just wondering if you can respond in terms of MIS, if you get any further, anything further to add to what Mr. Markle said. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, we obviously speak on behalf of a wide membership. Yeah. So the, the question that came up in discussion with the members of Energy UK um, was uh, around the definition, um, was quite wide ranging discussion. And the basic feeling was overall, certainly need to bespoke it for Scotland. Um, I think there were probably a number of members who, who might have been more in favour of urban versus rural and making that differentiation. It's something we might have to go back to members and say, would, th would this be an issue for you? But certainly the view was it's not enough to simply assume that the UK measurement will suffice and whether it will properly reflect things mm -hmm. in Scotland as well. And, and I mean, I've been off grid. I know the costs are different. Yeah. You know, I r remember the, the Calagas bill coming in and absolutely <laughs> dreading it. But <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm now on grid and it's so much cheaper. But um, so, yeah, I think it's going to be important that some time is taken and the right balance is struck that we are factoring in the different complex bits of, of, of the bill that people end up with. And Mr Armstrong, you talk a lot about how this relates to the Digital Economy Act, um, you know, in terms of MIS. Um, I'm not sure that was in our evidence, but um, there's, I think it was Energy UK, was it? Oh, apologies, actually. Oh, sorry, I was trying to remember the bit of the submission. I was thinking <laughs> mixed up here. Apologies, yes, indeed. Um, but just from our point of view, one thing I, I do want to raise is kind of 
there's an important point here around market-driven mechanisms to deliver energy efficiency versus government-controlled mechanisms. So I think what Mr Blacklock, when he refers to a woeful track record for energy efficiency in rural areas in Scotland, he's probably referring primarily to ECO. Um, and some of the numbers that were quoted were through ECO. Well, ECO is a market-driven instrument, which means that the suppliers will find the cheapest, the most cost-effective way to deliver the target, because that's what a market does, of course. Our programme, and I think I mentioned this earlier, is a government control programme, which means we do what the government asks us to do within our contract and within the delivery framework that it sets. And the delivery framework that the government set for Warmer Home Scotland is very clearly incentivised to tackle rural areas and to deliver the same level of performance in rural areas as we do in urban areas. And I think I mentioned earlier that a disproportionate amount of our activity takes place in rural areas versus urban urban areas when you compare the sort of relative population sizes. I think that's something go government could build on and say, look, well, we, if we set the parameters right, where we have control of the programmes and delivery, we can focus activity on rural areas where um, the challenges around fuel poverty are greater because we work very closely with Calor and others in delivering in those areas. So just what's the last thing, Convener, thanks for your indulgence on this. It, it, it's, um, you feel basically that if this, when this is enacted, that the number one uh, priority for the Scottish Government should be remote and rural island communities and um, vulnerable, perhaps, in urban areas. Would that be a particularly vulnerable in urban areas? I mean, we've talked about people with disabilities and long-term illnesses. Was, would you take that should be the priority rather than, for example, looking at a, a kind of let's just reduce the numbers? How, how, would, you, um, how would you think of the, the priorities in terms of taking this forward, that kind of... Would that combination be, just, be, be about right, or do you think there's anything that could be done to fine-tune that? I think, first and foremost, programmes have to be properly resourced so they can do all of those things. They can do the scale that they need to do. But within that, yes. I think it's right that government identifies priorities to say if rural areas, off-gas areas, are areas of focus, because that's where fuel poverty is greater, then I think it's, impo it's important that government gives itself the ability to design programmes, national programmes, in that way, if that's what it chooses to be its priority, it must retain the power to ensure that delivery reflects its policy priorities. Yeah, sorry, just but what I'm trying to say is that should be a priority rather than, for example, reducing the number of households by X thousand per year. It should focus on, if you like, quality rather than quantity, i.e. the most vulnerable, hard to reach, most difficult uh, households, because in, in, it's easier just to say, as we mentioned earlier, to go for those that are on the margins of fuel poverty rather than head on, um, you know, uh, deal with these uh, difficult uh, situations where, where, where people have been kind of bypassed over the last 15, 20 years. I completely agree. Yeah. I mean, the, when the UK government produced its fuel poverty strategy back in 2015, it admitted there'd been a policy failure in this area, but they also recognised there's a tension between they want to help the most amount of people, yeah, yeah. but if you help these people, that costs more money, so you end up helping less people. So we're going to help the most amount of people. Mm -hmm. So you still end up not addressing the... And you've come to a stage now with, what, probably 20 years of energy efficiency programmes where... Um, apologies to Glasgow. A bit, it's the countryside's turn to have a fairer proportion of, 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 of the support that, that um, um, <laughs> other people have had, particularly when you look at the direction of travel. You're talking about holistic policy. Um, the government has just um, consulted on um, Energy Efficient Scotland. And within that, they were sort of um, looking at um, thoughts around regulating the housing market using energy performance certificates. Um, now, given that the countryside has not had one much help in terms of improving the energy efficiency of, its, of, its, of the properties through government programmes, plus the fact that energy performance certificates in the countryside don't work as well because they don't measure energy efficiency, they measure pound notes. Because energy, because, which means that a, a, a comparable property, if you, if you airlifted a house out of the centre of Edin, Edinburgh and put it into the middle of a field somewhere, it will, the EPC will go down purely because it's using a different fuel. The, house is, the level of energy efficiency of the house, kilowatts per square metre is the same, but the score goes down. So if you then start looking at some of these proposals around regulating the housing market, and, and again... There's a lot of discussion about minimum EPC scores. And the problem, I, mean, I think in the previous session, um, one of the, the people that gave evidence was talking about 20, 25,000 pounds to, to get up to a level D. Well, the, the 
the Scottish government has done an enormous, brilliant work in this area around the sort of the REAPS modelling. Because the, when they started looking at this regulation of energy efficiency in the private sector, they got this guy or this, this company, specialist consultant, to model 350 different housing types in Scotland and then look at the, the cost implications of getting all these, these different houses up, going up through the levels. And the cost for off-grid, to get up to a D, it's not unusual to look at 20, 22,000. And the other thing is, it's then not a linear progression up through DCBA. It's almost like a hockey stick as you go up those levels. And it may well be, you get to C or you get to D, and the person in the house is no longer in fuel poverty. Then that's where I would say, that's when your climate change carbon requirements might kick in but in terms of the fuel poverty you have lifted that person out of fuel okay. poverty mr mr uh, Armstrong, you've been shaking your head quite a lot through mr blacklock's evidence i just i just think this this language about it being the countryside's turn and and this kind of question of it being an either or discussion right. is not helpful i think right. that, that if we are if we're here to talk about setting an ambition for 2040 then we'll have to do everything and there are almost 700,000 households to get to so i absolutely agree that within the framework you can create priorities and create areas of focus but i think at the expense of another demographic or the at the expense of another part of scotland which is the natural result of if you go down well it's your turn then it's your turn that not everything gets done i don't think it's for me that the best way to create policy yeah, I think we need priorities within each local authority area. It's just, uh, we're just looking at the, the yeah, to be fair, I don't think Mr Blacklock meant that my constituents shouldn't get any yeah. support <laughs> here. But I, I, not at all. Yes, no, I, I, context. Yeah, I, I agree with that, but I don't really think that's what he, he, he meant. I'd like to think it wasn't. Uh, Mr Markle. Um, I think this is a good time to kind of, you know, a lot of these discussions come from issues around financing, around how, where are we going to find the money to do a lot of this work? And at the moment, energy customers' bills are extremely regressive in the fact that you have fuel poor picking up the cost of fuel poor measures. So you can be in fuel poor and you cannot be able to afford your bill, but you're paying for other fuel poor measures in it. And we really need to look at this financing issue, and this is, can be a key part of the strategy as well, around how do we make sure that we keep, we, we could put some of those costs in central taxation, central funding, Whatever, because the, that, that's what this argument is about. Who, who's going to get tackled first? Well, the issue comes down to where's the money going to come from? And my fear is whenever we have strategies and we have new ideas around tackling fuel poverty, we just put it onto customers' bills. And we've seen that with Warm Home Discount, we've seen that with Eco. It adds monies onto customers' bill. And we need to find a new way to do it. Okay, that would be you. my big thing. Thank you. Graham, you wanted to come in briefly. Yeah, um, if, if we accept that there should be some rural proofing, and you know, you may, maybe you don't, but if you, if you do accept that, what needs to change in this bill, because that's what we're looking at, mm -hmm. in, in order to deliver that? Well, everyone's looking at me, um, quite rightly. Um, the, I think it's around that definition of rural, and Scottish government has already got something that it can work with there. And it's not about doing everything in the countryside. Glasgow will still get more than you know, its fair share. But it's about now, now is the time to start delivering some of these measures in the countryside. We had, I mean, some of the stuff in the past has been bordering on the outrageous in terms of we had an affordable warmth element to eco, which meant that if you were on qualifying benefits and your boiler broke down, you qualified for a free repair. And if it couldn't be repaired, you qualify for it for a, a, a free boy, a free insul boiler installation. Um, but not if you're on oil or, or LPG, because a lot of the people that were were uh, obligated, it was in their gift to decide whether or not they were, what measures they were going to deliver. So we had we had customers who um, were contacting us that had contacted the advice line in terms of support. Sorry, if I, if I can just jump in. Yeah. Um, it was specifically about what, what's in the bill. Oh, yeah, there's, no, sorry. There's only six pages to the bill. Yeah. So if All we right. were making a recommendation, and we're going to have to do that in our stage one report, what would that be in relation to the, 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 what's in front of us, which is a six-page bill? A rural, right, a, I would work on the basis of what they've tried to do with ECO in terms of rural, rural sub-obligation at a given level with a proper definition of rural. 
and then it's up to it's up to people to decide what it what represents a fair proportion. What was it? Ten percent? Is it twenty percent? I mean, twelve. I think it's eleven, twelve percent of houses in Scotland are rural off grid. So that might be a, a starting point. Yeah, I mean, I think the discussion has already started around the rural minimum income standard that was referred to earlier. I think that's going to be the, the meat of this discussion, and I think it's important to land in the right place there in terms of um, colleagues. Uh, last week's session, um, Di Alexander and others have got a lot more experience in, in this than I have, but I think landing, listening to the evidence that's coming from um, those groups and those individuals, I think they'll um, give you the basis of um, a recommendation in that area, I think. Great. Scottish minimum income standard, where we're all being part of that. Okay, thank you. Uh, finally, Alec. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think just following on for that, the the last session that we had, the councils and the housing associations, they did talk about the difference in energy efficiency ratings between the public sector and the private sector in terms of private rents and and and, and social rent, um, and and then you've got rural. Uh, there is a criticism that the draft strategy is light on on yeah. programmes um, and policy to actually look at all these different areas and tackle them. And I suppose my question is, how difficult is it therefore to be able to have a robust and meaningful analysis of the cost of reaching that 5% uh, by 2040? Because unless you can actually put a cost on it, and, and, and have those programmes, then, you know, how meaningful is, it, is, is the targets? Comments? Yeah, I agree. I think you, the, the targets have to be costed and they have to be resourced. And I think there are several organisations that have, have made estimates around this already. Energy Action Scotland, um, what was Consumer Focus, I think is now Consumer Futures. And um, these organisations have done um, quite detailed research. Citizens by Scotland have also um, looked at this around what programs cost what energy efficiency improvement measures will cost what the likely packages might be the households might need to take them out of fuel poverty or you know protect them from going into fuel poverty i think the work is out there and i think it's important to kind of um draw on it in because i i agree with the statement i think the strategy and the ambition without saying this is what we think it will cost and this is how it needs to be resourced is only a, a fraction of the story to my point around financing the strategy needs to be clear on one yeah the, the biggest elephant in the room how much is this going to cost but where is this where's this money going to come from and it can't come from customers bills okay and take, taking that the step further then because others would argue that the benefits of this and when we discussed that in the last session as well are enormous both for the individuals concerned who live in the the houses but in terms of the economic benefits for for the wider economy, again, how difficult is it to to be able to set out and, and estimate what those benefits are? Well, I, I listened to that question. I'm glad you actually asked that. I, the, it's been the figure that I've been trying to find around looking at the benefits of energy efficiency and the wider impact on the economy. Now, I need to go away and check, but I think there has been a study done in Dunedin, in New Zealand, looking at this over the last 10 years. Um, that would be quite useful as well, because Dunedin has some very similarities to Edinburgh. So we'd be able to look specifically at that. I can certainly find a copy of the report and send it if it does include that. Because, and if it doesn't, we, we need to be, and somebody needs to be sitting down and, and finding out and doing a, an economic study on the benefits of energy efficiency to the wider um, to the wider economy, because as I've spoken before about smart metering and the benefits to the health service and benefits to social policy, that that could be massive and it could be an absolute game changer in one reducing customers' bills overall from the obligations that customers that are put on customers' bills. Um, you know, in, in terms of customers' bills, about 140 pounds is added on to every customer's bills from just obligations that that energy companies have to add on to their customers' bills. And so, how we can reduce that down, how we can reduce overall bills down, will be key to getting people out of your poverty. Okay. I think part of the challenge is that the benefits of investing in energy efficiency are so broad. So I can tell you that we've 
um, run Warm Home Scotland for the last three and a half years, and we've created about 300 new jobs, about 100 new apprenticeships, and I can tell you some of the sort of um, benefits at that level of one program. But you would need engagement from the health sector around if we've helped 14,000 homes in the last three years, how many of them weren't then readmitted to hospital because we made their homes warmer? If we've helped 14,000 homes, how many didn't need as many visits in a social care context? You, you would need the engagement of a lot of other sectors and parts of government to because the benefits are so broad. I mean, we haven't even got into things like educational attainment, social exclusion, some of the things that are impacted by improving energy efficiency. And it is challenging to quantify the benefits because they are very broad. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it therefore leaves you wondering why. I mean, it's been said earlier that, that the 2016 target was not met. I mean, have, has, has any panel looked at uh, the experience of that previous target? I mean, what was what was the failures there? Was there a failure to to have a proper strategy? Was there a failure to finance it properly? Why why did it fail? I, I don't know why it failed, but I would have thought technological changes will will now take away some of that doubt. I mean, obviously, there's a bit that that statement and that target came from. The Housing Act of 2001, I think, and then there was a statement made in 2002 giving that target of 2016. I have no idea where that target actually came from, but I mean, we've made there's been massive changes in terms of how we can monitor electricity use and energy use, and there's been massive changes in terms of renewable energy. Um, but th the bottom line will still be how do we actually make sure that we can fund that going forward? I don't know whether enough funding was put aside for that. Um, th the thing I I am remembering, though, that in terms of the last few years, in terms of the Scottish government's the um, with the energy strategy, and also with the uh, energy efficiency Scotland, there have been sums of money discussed. I think 500 million was announced a couple of years ago as part of the energy strategy, um, and I don't I don't know at the moment where that sits in relation to have any workings being done as to how much of that pot might be directed towards the en energy efficiency element, for instance, of the fuel poverty bill. Um, so I think that's one that the government department will need to come back on in terms of is there new money, is there any new money, or is it relying on money that's already been announced in the life of this parliament? Okay. okay. Kenny, very briefly. Yeah. Refer to the, the previous uh, Labour Liberal executive. I don't think they predicted the energy prices were going to go up 155% and incomes only 38%. And I, I would say that suggests that's why it's failed. I think one way to look at how the measures that were introduced have succeeded to some extent as if uh, the only the only way would be to say if if fuel prices had went up only 38 percent how many people would have fallen out of poverty then and then you could compare whether or not the strategy was successful but you that would have to have to do a wee bit of a number crunching but really it was just you know if prices go up like that and incomes go up like that that's where the gap is we we are looking at prices going up again in the next year yeah yeah we, very much for that. I think that those well, the the last comment highlights the pr the difficulties that the government's got, given that they have absolutely no control over oil prices. But listen, can I thank you very much for your your time and and for your answers? It was very very useful for the committee, and that will all be getting fed into the bill. Um, well, the evidence. Can I now suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave the table? Thank you very much.
Business is consideration of negative instrument 344 as listed on the agenda and I refer members to paper number 3. The instrument is laid under the negative procedure which means that its provisions will come into force unless the Parliament votes on motions to annul it. No motions to annul have been laid. Delegated powers and the Law Reform Committee has not drawn the instruments to the Parliament attention on any of its reporting grounds. Do members have any comments on the instrument? No. In that case, I invite the committee to agree that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument. Are we agreed? Yes. Thank you. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Thank you.